Good morning. I'm going to call us to order. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Executive Committee of the Tennessee Tech Board of Trustees. And to anyone joining us this morning um, that was at our breakfast, I, I see some of you here that were at our breakfast with the uh, athletics group, the group of coaches, NCAA coaches. That was really a lot of fun getting to know you all, and we're glad you're here. Um, hopefully, we can do what you need to be done for athletics. Um, the first order of business, oh, excuse me, I need to uh, call the roll. Trust, Trustee Lowry. Here. Trustee Rose. Here. Trustee Harper. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Now, the first order of business is the approval of the minutes of our September 28th meeting. Hopefully, you have those in your diligent packet, and I'd entertain a motion with respect to those minutes. So moved. Thank you. Um, Chairman, uh, Trustee Lowry moves to approve. Is there a second? Thank you, Ms. Rose. Uh, is there any discussion? Hearing none, we can take a voice vote, I believe. Is that right? A voice vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, thank you. That's That motion carries. Um, the next item of business is, the, is my uh, presentation to you on the outcome of our self-evaluation. I'll remind you that sometime in the last month or two, we did a, um, we sent out a survey. Most of you participated and uh, responded to questions that we asked about our effectiveness, our uh, our role as a board, and this is all part of our, is it our SACCOC accreditation, Dr. Ho? Is that, am I saying that right? Yes. So we were required to do this as part of that. Plus, it's just good business, of course, to ask ourselves from time to time, are we doing what we need to be doing? So I took the, the comments that were offered, and there were a number of good constructive comments. And I did not reflect them all here, but I reflected the ones that I thought we had some ability to do something um, about as a board. So I just, um, if you'll go to my slide three, there we go, on board training. You've had a copy of this in your book already, or in your diligence, so hopefully you've already seen this. But there were a couple of um, comments about training. I, I put this in quotes because someone said it this way, and I thought it was terrific that they would like to hear brief, concise reminders on specific topics of governance. That does not mean that we want a, a full-blown lecture every single meeting about governance, but I do think brief, concise reminders about governance are terrific. And so I asked the secretary, and I think you're going to be researching this. Is that right, Mr. Secretary? Correct. Uh, I've asked Lee to see if the AGB, the Association of Governing Boards, that is our kind of our industry group for university boards, if they have video modules, I, I, I'm sure you've all done your cyber training. Uh, if you haven't, shame on you, get your cyber training done. They're going to come after you if you haven't done it yet. But um, when I did that, I thought to myself, this is a very efficient way to get this training in, and I thought it might be a good way for us to have some training on um, on governance. So if those are not available, then Lee has agreed to give us some brief, concise reminders about governance at each of our meetings. But again, if we can find a way to do it outside the time of our meeting, then I think it makes better use of all of our time. Anybody have any questions about that one or thoughts? Then the next slide was um, interaction with students and faculty and I, um, I, I, there were a number of comments about this in different ways, but I, I integrated some of those. Um, one of the comments was that we as a board should have more opportunity to interact with students, perhaps on visits to campus, and I thought that was a really interesting idea. Um, we've done that before. We took, a, we took a tour of a res hall. It's been a couple of years now, I guess, since we've done that. We've had a couple of those opportunities, but I think as we move forward, we need to find opportunities through our social event time that we do the night before the board meetings. These are not times we're going to deliberate. This is stuff where we just need to get out and 
see where their, how our students are living, maybe have lunch or dinner at the cafeteria or something like that. So I thought that was a good comment. And then the second comment here is one that I've, uh, I haven't spoken to the provost directly, but I, I think you got the message and I've, I got the feedback that you were good with this. Um, I've asked the provost to consider having each of our deans, one of the, this was a comment actually from one of our, um, our board members who suggested that we hear from more from the actual faculty, the deans, the chairs, those kind of things. So I thought we also had some questions about how are we measuring success of our faculty? And I thought, well, this is a good opportunity to let our deans tell us how they're measuring success. So I'm gonna ask that starting with our next meeting in our academic and student affairs uh, committee, Ms. Rose, if you're okay with this, I'd like for y'all to incorporate and we'll probably give you some kind of a template so we don't have, so we have consistency across our uh, presentations from our deans. But um, it'd take us a couple of years to get through all the deans, doing it one dean at a time, but I think that would be a good way to do it. We'll let the deans tell us about their approach to evaluating effectiveness and then what they're seeing, what, what are the outcomes of that, both with their students, with their faculty, and with the alums. And I think it'll be a really good opportunity. We love hearing from the provost every meeting and she will continue to give her report, but this would be in addition to that, do a little deeper dive with each college. Those of us who are in whatever college we were in know something more about that college. And it's, it's gonna be interesting to me to hear from some of the colleges I'm not as familiar with. So I think that'll be very good. Anybody have any questions or comments about that? Chair Harper, I have a comment. Yes, please. Yeah, Definitely. so in addition to the deans, um, we do also have two other groups on campus that I think it'd be useful to hear from. The Staff Advisory Council, right, so that we maybe have a, an annual report on issues that staff are concerned about, and then also Faculty Senate, because that's a, a board that's elected, right? So to hear, maybe, I don't want to hear at every meeting, that would make for long meetings, but maybe just an annual report kind of in the way that we hear now from our student representative. Thanks. I'm, I'm certainly willing to consider that. I will tell you that we have tried to accommodate both of those two through our breakfast meetings. We do that with the faculty senate twice a year, and we've done it with the staff advisory committee once this year already. It, it gives us a real, and I, and I can promise you, they are very brutally honest with us and probably a little more, I know you're shocked by that. They're probably a little bit more open even about what they say when it's just one-on-one -on -one with the trustees. Um, so hopefully they're getting what they need from that. And I know I'm getting a lot out of my interaction with them at the breakfast. And so it's just, uh, that's been our way to approach that. We've been doing the faculty senate for, since the beginning, I think. We've done that twice a year. I think this was our first staff advisory committee um, second, second breakfast with them this year, and both of them have been terrific. We've very constructive, very positive. Um, you know, certainly not everything's bright and rosy, but telling us what's what what we need to be focused on. I I have found that to be very helpful, and they're very candid. So, but thank you for that. Yes, I, I appreciate that. That's perfect. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And then um, the last slide I have is other possible issues to be addressed. Um, one was a question about recruitment and retention of faculty and staff. And I think that's a really good one to hear about at some point. I'd like to get past our Mercer study on salaries before we decide, before we do a deep dive on any further thought about recruitment and retention. But I do think that's an interesting one to hear about where our recruitment challenges are, uh, what might be some retention challenges, um, and understanding reasons for turnover. I think that's a good one that we should have some under, better understanding. Um, I, I've spoken to Dr. Stinson about the second bullet here, long-term financial planning. This was very specifically, someone said, we really ought to be thinking about five and 10 year scenarios. And I think that's a great, role for this board. I think that's, I think as we think about what the board should do, looking at budgets, of course, is critical. We have to do that. We're required to do that. But if we're going to be strategic as a board to think about five years out and 10 years out, and if we're going to get to 15,000 students, what's that going to mean in terms of what are we going to have to do with with um, uh, tuition, but also what are we going to have to, where are we going to spend money to have housing and 
roads and parking and all of that, classrooms for these students. And I know Dr. Oldham thinks about that a lot, and Dr. Stinson thinks about that a lot, but as a board, we haven't focused on that. And so I've asked Dr. Stinson to be thinking about that, and, and I'll be honest, I think it may require some additional resources. She didn't tell me this. I, I said this myself when I talked to Dr. Oldham about this feels like a long-term planning and kind of strategic planning may be a little different than what we've got in our wheelhouse right now in Dr. Stinson's organization. And so we may end up needing some additional help there, externally or internally. I'm hoping internally, but uh, we'll be working. She's nodding, so I hope that's right. And then a really good one that came out of, um, I think, our last meeting where we had the the policy on artificial intelligence and how it's going, how it's capable of being used in uh, in our or how it should be used in our classes. The effect of changing technologies and their anticipated impact on education it, it's it's mind boggling to me. Um, you know, of course, I I I came to school here when we programmed on punch cards, so the technology has changed a teensy bit since then. Um, but this is a step function time uh, in, in higher ed and the ethics around all of that and, and the, um, the challenges for our faculty. I, I was, as most of you know, I taught for nine and a half years here as adjunct, just one little class a semester, but it gave me a great taste of what some of the challenges are when you're dealing with really smart 22 year olds. They are really smart and they are really clever and they have really good ideas and they also know how to work around the system <laughs> if they have to. So it's, it'll be interesting to see how we, uh, how we adapt to this, um, to this new world of AI and all of the things that come with it. So that'll just be one that we'll be thinking about. So those were the things that I heard about in the um, in the surveys that we did. Again, if you don't see your specific comments here, I, I promise they were noted, and I've spoken with the president about all of them. But I think these were the ones that I felt like had kind of a headliner uh, impact. Is there anything anybody else wants to say or offer? All right. Well, then I will shut up. That was a lot of rambling by me, and I'm sorry. Um, I think our next, and, and so we'll do another one of those surveys in three years? At least three, but we can do it more often if so desired. Okay. But, but no later than three years from this year. Okay, very good. All right. Um, if there's no other business on that, then, I, then the next item is, is there any other business to come before the committee? Hearing none, I will call the executive committee adjourned. And I will turn the um, I will turn the the podium over to Chairman Rose to chair the audit. Excuse me, Academic and Student Affairs Committee. Thank you, Chairman Harper, and good morning. Uh, and we will uh, call to order the Committee of Academic Student Affairs Committee. Secretary Ray, will you call the roll, please? Trustee Luna. Here. Trustee Wilmore. Here. Trustee Rose. Here. Trustee Doris. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, sir. And the first item of business that you all have in your packet, the minutes from our September 28th meeting, and we need to get a approval of, of those minutes. I move that we approve the minutes. Okay. Trustee Se Wilmore approves. Seconded. And, Appropriately seconded, and I think uh, Chairman or Secretary Ray will need to get a roll call vote on that. A any questions or comments on it before we vote? Okay, Secretary Ray. Trustee Luna. Aye. Trustee Wilmore. Aye. Trustee Rose. Aye. Motion passes. Very good. Thank you, sir. So next we have Provost Bruce up, and uh, you've got several things you're going to do for us this this morning. Um, uh, and in fact, I think we'll uh, you're, you'll start by giving us uh, an update on Tech's uh, quality assurance funding and present some of the highlights of recent activities in academic affairs. And then you'll go into uh, about four different policy recommendations that we'll have to get roll call votes on each of those. But so just 
take it over and go through it all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Chair, uh, Trustee Rose. So uh, before I, I jump into the slides in my presentation, I, I don't want to be accused of, of burying the lead. We have two really great uh, pieces of news to share with you and updates. The first is related to our SAC COC accreditation. As you know, we recently went through the fifth year interim report, and then that means that we're now coming into the next few years of doing our full reaffirmation of our SAC COC accreditation. And we received news just in the last couple of days that we have been approved for uh, doing what is called a differentiated review process. And what this means is that if you were doing a regular SAC COC reaffirmation review process, you have between 80 and 100 standards that you have to document and demonstrate that the, we have to document and demonstrate that the university is in compliance with. And when we did our fifth year interim report, there's a subset of those standards about 18 to 20, I believe, that we, that we include in that. With a differentiated review, we do the number of standards that we have to demonstrate compliance with goes from somewhere between 80 and 100 down to 40. And so this is a, a, very, a very good news for the university. And, you know, it'll still be a tremendous effort to do all of our self-study and the preparation for the reaffirmation and the site visits. But this will lighten that load significantly and really is a testament to the quality and the stability of the university. We have to demonstrate several, several qualities of the university to even be considered for a differentiated review. And so this is a big testament to the quality and the stability of the university. And I really want to recognize Dr. Sharon Ho and uh, for her efforts. She is our SAC COC liaison and she leads our efforts in our SAC COC reaffirmation. So I really want to recognize her. And she's our secret weapon. Yes, she is. <laughs> and speaking of that, uh, I have some inf detailed information in the presentation, but I really want to just uh, highlight right out of the gate that our quality assurance score, which is uh, a score that we have for uh, that we're scored on by the state, by THEC, in regards to the quality of our academic programming. You know, that score can be anywhere from zero to 100, and this year we scored a perfect 100. And to our knowledge, we are the only university in the history of this being done in the state. It's, this quality scoring has been going on for uh, approximately 40 years. So, and this, in this uh, quality assurance score that's on the basis of, of zero to 100, I do believe we are the first and only university to have scored a perfect 100 on the quality of our academic programs. And once again, Dr. Ho is the lead on those activities. So I really, really wanted to just say that at the beginning before we get kind of down into the details of, of a lot of this in the presentation. So the, the first um, item I would like to present to you is an update on our performance metrics, the quality assurance score being one of those. As you might recall, in 2021, so about two years ago, we held an informational session for the board where we went through a detailed presentation and discussion of how we define and measure success of academic affairs. And for me as provost, when I'm defining success of academic affairs, I go back to the mission and vision statement of the university. And I ask the question, are we meeting the needs of the state? That is, are we educating and graduating students in disciplines that Tennessee needs? And are we uh, supporting the government and industry and citizens of Tennessee through the application of our expertise through research and outreach? 
And so uh, these metrics are really based, that's the heart of why these are the four key metrics that we use. Uh, and so there's, we measure virtually every aspect of what we do in academic affairs, but all of those measurements roll up into these four key metrics. The number of degrees that we're, that how many students are we actually graduating with degrees, our quality of our academic programming, the research and development expenditures is a key uh, metric for that research and service arm of, of our faculty role. And then the fourth uh, metric is fiscal gain. It's the revenue divided by the instructional cost. And a good rule of thumb is that's typically should be around two, which means that for all of our ENG funding, the budget to operate the university, we're spending about half on instruction and directly on the instructional costs. And so that, that fiscal gain is, is giving us an indicator of how cost effective we're being in academic affairs. How uh, well are we using the financial resources that we have that are dry, to drive those other three metrics. Can, can you expound a little bit on when you say the quality Mm -hmm. Just, I mean, you mentioned one thing, but just maybe a little more. Yeah, I'll, I have another slide. I have a much deeper slide on it uh, that goes into more detail about that quality assurance score. So I'll, I'll get to that in just a sec. Um, but this just shows the actual metric number, the quantitative measure of, of those four metrics over the last uh, seven, seven or eight years. And you can see that with the most recent data, that we have, uh, how we're doing in each of those metrics compared to previous years. So for example, for every 100 students that we have enrolled at Tech, uh, we, were, we graduated, we awarded 25.4 degrees, which is very high. Um, that means our students are progressing and, and through their program and actually reaching that point of being awarded a degree at a, at a good rate. Uh, the quality assurance score, you can see that. Um, we went up to 100 in this most recent score. The R&D uh, activations in number of millions, that should be a familiar uh, chart to you because our interim VPR presented that in his annual report at the last board meeting. And then that fiscal gain is uh, pretty high at 2.27. So we're doing those four metrics, we're doing very well. Um, and hopefully these slides are starting to look familiar to some of you because we did it in the informational session and then each year I give you an update on exactly how we are performing in those four key areas. Pro Provost Bush, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. If you look at the degrees per 100, there was a big step up in 20, from 2015 to 16. What, can you explain? That's a huge step up, and I'm just curious. It was fluctuating a little bit even before that. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it was kind of fluctuating. If I had shown you like 10, 20 years, it was hovering around 22, 23, and then we did have kind of a little jump there, and we've kind of we've been a, been able to sustain that. Um, part of that um, is the, uh, you know, even that jump from from kind of in the last couple of years, I believe is related to our flat rate tuition model. Yeah. So, uh, you know, work, putting extra emphasis on retention and student success and academic success of the students is a big driver in that, keeping that degrees per 100 students at that, at that level. If, if I could add to that real quick, uh, I'm glad you clued in on that, Fred, because to me, this is one of the, the most critical metrics in terms of efficiency of operation. I mean, it, that's, that's really telling us how efficiently we're graduating students, which, which means that they're finishing with, with uh, quicker and with less debt. So uh, I'm glad you picked up on that. And, oh, and I do want to say one thing before I get to trustee sites. Those are undergrad degrees. So that's 100. I should have had that. That's not just students. It's undergraduate students. Yes. That goes sorry. to my question. Uh, it would be helpful to me and maybe some of the other board members if we could see the uh, formulas that you use to come up with these numbers. The formulas for... In other words, you're saying 
We've got fifth, so, so the degrees per 100 students, it is really taking just the, the, the student enrollment for the fall census day and then looking at the total number of degrees that were awarded during that academic year and then dividing it. And uh, the, the quality assurance score, I'll go into more detail. That's a complicated formula. Um, R&D activations are simply just summing up how many uh, grants and contracts were activated in a given year. And then the fiscal gain is taking the E&G revenue straight out of the budget that's presented to you each year and then the instructional costs that is presented and simply dividing that. Um, but the quality assurance is a more complicated formula, and that is, that is a THEC formula. So they have a score sheet, and they score us, and then you, get, and you, get a, you, you accrue points up to a possible 100. Does that help answer your question? So it would be helpful if we had that on the screen so we could see how you got to your number. I, I think it's on the next slide, Johnny. Okay, yeah. I think so on this here for the quality assurance, so really I want to I want to dive into this a little bit more. Um, and I, I this is the same slide I present every year at this kind of late November, early December meeting. And each year I update what was our score for that year and then by and then what was the average for the other LGI institutions. So on the left hand side, the uh, metrics that drive the quality assurance score are based on this point system. And so senior exit exam, we, re we require when students are applying for graduation, undergraduate students are applying for graduation, they take a standardized exam as a part of that application. And the exam is designed to measure critical thinking skills. And we use a, a standard exam that many other universities use so that we can not only compare how a cohort of students are doing compared to longitudinally, longitudinally our students have done in the past, but also comparing it against the national mean. And so we do that for all graduating students. Then we also have something called major field assessments. So we have discipline specific exams that the graduating seniors take. So if you're a, a civil engineering student, you take a, a, an exam on civil engineering knowledge and skills. If you're a earth sciences student, you take an earth sciences exam. And where possible, if there's a national standard exam, we use that so that we can do the same thing. We can compare how our students are, are performing compared to the national mean. And those give us a lot of insight into how are we actually preparing our students and educating them but to be able to measure against national norms at the time of their graduation. The other factors are the academic programs and whether they are accredited. We do each year, we're on a rotation. If a program is, is not, if there's not a national accrediting body, we do a very extensive program review that has external evaluators. They do self-studies. It's very similar to an accreditation uh, site visit. And we get scored on how well we perform and how well those external evaluators score us on our academic programs. We also survey students, we survey alumni, and we rotate that. So one year we might, uh, we are on a three-year rotation. So this most recent year, we surveyed alumni. And we, they, they, we use the same survey over and over so we can look across time, what are the alumni saying about their experiences here, but we can also compare it to the national mean because we use a survey that many other universities use. And so we, if you just kind of continue down through there, based on all of those activities, we get, we can accrue points at up to a maximum of 100. And last year at this time, I was very proudly presenting to you that we scored a 93. And at that time, I didn't know yet what all the other universities had scored that had not been made public. I can now tell you that, that the average for the LGI universities was 88. So we scored a 93 in the average 
for, in the state was 88. This year, as I said, we scored a 100. I don't yet know what the other universities have scored this year to know what the state average is, but I'll report that to you next year at this time. Um, so to me, the, the, the value of all of this is the continuous quality improvement that it drives us toward. You know, taking the outcomes of those program reviews, the evaluator comments, uh, survey student comments and alumni comments, we're using that to continuously improve our programming and our academic programs. To me, that's, that's the, the primary value. The secondary value is it really does equate to funding from the state. And so the way that works is if you scored a perfect 100, then that next fiscal year, whatever the state appropriation was, you get a 5.45% kind of a top off on that. And so, and if you score less than 100, then it's prorated down from that. So you can't really say a point is worth a dollar amount because it's dependent on what your state appropriation is the following year. But you can see that last year's score of 93 resulted in 3.2 million in quality assurance funding from the state. And that's really just a part of our performance-based funding that we receive from the state. In, the, uh, in your diligent uh, book, there is a more detailed report behind this. And you can see the exact score sheets that THEC scores us on all of those exams, all of the program reviews. There's, there's a detail that I knew I wouldn't have time to go into in the presentation, but I wanted you to have that there for reference. So switching gears a little bit, I wanna uh, highlight some faculty out of the College of Agriculture and Human Ecology, and I'm highlighting four faculty today. Mainly, I chose these faculty because of their key contributions in two new BS uh, programs that, th that you as a board approved for us to launch in 2022. So the new BS and design studies, we took two concentrations out of our human ecology Bachelor of Science and created a, with your approval, a Bachelor of Science in Design Studies. And Mr. Gunnels and Dr. Uphol uh, play a very key role, not only in, in doing that, but in proposing it and then actually uh, operationalizing those plans. Last fall, we had our first uh, enrollments in the Design Studies program, and that was 76 students. And this fall, it's already up to 119. Now, part of the reason for pulling those concentrations out and creating a standalone program was to give it more visibility and to help with recruitment and enrollment. And that has, that has resulted in very positive results. Um, Mr. Gunnell and Dr. Uphole are here, and I just want to tell you a little bit about them. Mr. Gunnels is a two-time graduate of Tennessee Tech. And he did his graduate work at Virginia Tech in architecture. And he leads the architecture and interior design concentration in that degree program. And that means doing the curricular, over, uh, overviewing the curriculum, updating courses, teaching courses, and leading that effort. And uh, one interesting thing that he shared with me was that he has really incorporated the capital projects on campus into the courses that he is teaching. So for example, his students are, are, he's taking his students through regularly through the Ashraf Islam Engineering Building construction site and incorporating that into the courses. So our many construction projects on campus are benefiting the students in that program. And Dr. Uphol is uh, an associate professor in human ecology. She just was promoted from assistant to associate this summer. She was one of the people in the uh, group of faculty that you approved to tenure. And she is leading the uh, fashion merchandising and design concentration in the BS for design studies. Her BS, master's, and PhD are all from West, 
Virginia University. And one thing that she shared with me was each year she takes students on a trip. So it's not a study abroad trip. It's a, a, a trip within the, the US. And this spring, or this year, she took a group of design study students to New York, and they had a five-day study uh, tour of design studios, uh, manufacturing sites, and showrooms in New York, and she helped them network professionally so that many of them now can have internships uh, back in New York in this next year. So I wanted them to stand up and be recognized for their work. And the other two faculty are Dr. Ayers and Dr. Bohay. Um, they are key contributors, and there are many faculty <laughs> that participate in both these degree programs, but I'm highlighting some of our more junior faculty uh, who have really are playing key roles. Uh, the, they are key contributors to our new BS in Animal Sciences, and that was also launched in 2022. Started out in fall of 2022 with 50 students enrolled, and this year it's already up to 102. So it's also being very successful, and, uh, and in no small part uh, to, uh, to the contributions of these two individuals. Dr. Ayers uh, joined us in January 2022, and she has degree BS, master's, and PhDs in animal science and food science from Ohio State and West Virginia University. Her area of specialization is poultry science. She spent much of her first year standing up our new Poultry Science Research Center. And if you've not had a chance to see that, it's a very impressive center. We had a state grant and a grant from the Appalachian uh, Regional Commission to build that facility and equip it. And she really put in a lot of work in standing that up as a brand new assistant professor, which is a very impressive feat. And she's already had several funded projects, research projects, mostly funded out of industry. Um, for example, Coke Foods and Mill Park Industries has funded her to work on water additive products to reduce salmonella and broiler chickens. And so uh, she's including undergraduate students in those research projects. And the other faculty is Dr. Siana Bohay. Uh, she is also an assistant professor and she joined us in August, 2021. Her degrees in animal science and animal nutrition are from Texas A&M and Kansas State. And she really focuses much of her effort and attention on the relevance and rigor of the courses in our pre-vet program and infusing new instructional technologies and undergrad research in that, in that program. So they are doing a fantastic job, off to a great start as faculty here, and I wanted them to stand up and be recognized. So that concludes the provost report, unless you have more questions or, or comments. Fine report. I, I have a question, not about your report, but maybe beyond it. Um, studying other universities, what other options are out there at other places? Uh, I've come across the, a couple of places offer what they call a mini-mester, mini-semester between semesters. Have we ever investigated the pluses, minuses, possibility of doing the same? And if so, what are those details? Yes, we have. Um, uh, many universities will do like a winter, well, they call it like a, a winter break session, and it'll be a little mini term, say in early January. And we have investigated that. We do have, it's not exactly like that, but we do have seven week courses. And so we do have courses that are offered over a seven week period. And so when you have particularly graduate students or non-traditional students that aren't full-time students, they like to take courses in, in series, not in parallel. And so these seven week terms help them uh, progress through their program without having multiple courses at one time. They also help with students that maybe have struggled academically, had to drop some courses, need to pick up courses, and that halfway point, there's still a seven week term with some courses available to them for that. So it's not exactly what you're talking about, but um, we have looked at that and 
if I'm not mistaken, before my time, we did have some winter terms at some point, I, I believe, in the history, historically, but I don't know that might have, if we did, it was before my time. Yeah, one, th one I'm familiar with is just like a week to a week and a half, I think it is, at the end of the semester, the fall semester, where, and not to say that, you know, some, some courses are more conducive to quick learning than others. If you're writing a bunch of term papers, that doesn't work, but like a history class or something like that that's a, a requirement for a, for a degree is something that maybe you can knock out in a week and a half. You, I know the example that I know of, it's like seven hours a day every single day and they march through and that way they're able to pick up, catch up, do those type of things, which is very beneficial as you would guess for, for those students. Well, we do have a Maymester and that is a mini term. I forgot to think about, to mention that. We have a Maymester. So at the end of the spring term, we have this mini term before the summer sessions start. And that mini term is often where we do study abroad, we do, uh, uh, courses that maybe require a lot of field work, so you're going to be out in the field all day, every day for, you know, several, for a couple of weeks at a stretch. Um, so we do have a mini term at the end of the spring semester that's called the Maymester. Then we go into summer terms. Okay, well, is it, is it worthy to ask the question, is it worthy to maybe look at it a little deeper and see if those might be options that we might want to incorporate? Um, maybe look at it a little more? I would be very happy to do that. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, let me just, and uh, I think it's a great idea, and I'd love to do more of it. Let me just share with you just a little bit of some of the challenges around this. Uh, some of it's financial aid related uh, because the timing of financial aid and requirements there. Sometimes it's the uh, grade reporting issues that get into it as far as timing and accounting for the grades but uh, we, we, we do try to be very flexible and actually the timing's good because as we uh, as we move to implement uh, eventually a new student ERP system I think it could uh, it could be even more flexible so I appreciate that uh, I'm excited about the work these uh, professors have done it's a wonderful program one of the reasons we set this up, as you recalled earlier, was to improve or increase the number of students coming to Tennessee Tech. Do we know what that is? And are these students that are growing into this department coming from outside the university or are they coming from the university? Excellent question. And so that first year, you, we, there was a, it's a mix of the first, that first year of fall 2022, someone who was already, say, in the animal science concentration and said, yes, I want in the full animal science degree program. So they may have switched their catalog to the newest catalog and they switched. So they were really coming from internal and switching. But we saw through, and I don't have the data right in front of me, but looking at our fall applications and admissions of new freshmen, both of these degree programs had a significant in, increase in freshman apps and admits into those programs. So they're definitely growing from external too. Since that was one of the main reasons the board set up these new uh, programs, could we see that data when you get a chance to send it to us? I'm more than happy to do that. Thank you. I would like to return, this is Trustee Luna, really quickly to um, the degrees per 100 students. Um, there's that jump and Trustee Lowry asked a question about why that jump is. One of the things that happened that year, right, or around that time period was hiring Provost Bruce and also President Oldham, there was a real push towards retention. So that's the time when faculty were asked to please start tracking attendance in classes, identifying freshmen who were maybe struggling and making a true effort to, re to retain those freshmen. And as someone who taught big 150 person classes, I can tell you tracking attendance for 150 students is a challenge. So I wanna point it out here because to me, that tells me that what we are doing is working and that effort was worth it. So other faculty who are still doing that, I, I wanna, anyone who's watching this, point out it's working and it's doing good. Thanks. We invested in some technologies to assist with that so that, uh, you know, 
QR codes where students can just hold their phone up in class. So if you have 150 people, they can immediately hold their phone up. The QR code's up there very briefly. They, they scan it, they get counted as being present, it disappears, and the faculty member can move on without trying to roll call and take up a lot of class time. And, and uh, we invested in card scanners and some of our large auditoriums so students can just swipe their, their ID as they enter the room to really help with that. But it's still a significant undertaking of a faculty member to track attendance of that many and follow up when there's absences. That's the, the time commitment part, too. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Provost Bruce, I'll thank you for, uh, for uh, recognizing the, the professors that are here today, and particularly because they're from the College of Agriculture and Human College, which <laughs> I'm a proud of you, <laughs> I, had, I had to bring it in, and I noticed Dean Smith's back here, and I'm proud of that college and proud of all of y'all in it. Trustee Wilmore will, will know who I'm talking about, but I remember the quote of Krista McCullough, and she said, I, I touch the future, I teach. And what you all do to the students is incredibly important to this organization. We're all from a governing standpoint, but you're where the rubber meets the road and you have the impact on the students every single day and the difference you'll make in their life. When they're my age, I promise they'll still remember it. So mm -hmm. thank you for what you do. And I really want to recognize Dr. Melinda Anderson and Dr. Baer, the chairs of those two departments and Dean Smith, uh, because they really work hard on the recruitment and retention of these faculty. And so you can see the quality of the faculty that we are recruiting and hiring into the faculty lines. So next I wanna go on, I don't have any more slides, but moving on to the next agenda item. Uh, so your next agenda item can be found in tab four on page 33 of your diligent book. Uh, so tab four, page 33. This is an update on the new academic programs previously approved by the Board of Trustees. And I give this report each year at this particular board meeting. Uh, we just update it with uh, new data. And so we refer to this as the post-approval monitoring. So if you hear me slip up and use the word PAM, <laughs> I'm really meaning post-approval monitoring. We just throw that jargon around in our office so much I'm likely to say it. We monitor new programs, new degree programs, for a period of five to seven years. And uh, we monitor enrollments, numbers of graduates, and we compare those actuals to what we projected when we were proposing the degree program. And we monitor the progress on achieving accreditations as well. So based on these PAM reports, uh, anywhere that we find that a newly launched degree program isn't meeting our projections or is struggling in enrollments in some way, we go back and start reviewing. Well, maybe we need to relook at the admission criteria. What are, what are we doing in terms of recruitment plans? And so that helps us uh, do self-corrections in the early years of a degree program. And so that table, if you kind of look at any, any one page, you kind of move from left to right across that table in terms of when things were approved through the different shared governance processes, when the board approved, when THEC approved. The column that's probably most interesting to you is to the far right, and it just shows a snapshot of uh, if it's still within those first few years, what were the projections? What are the enrollments and graduates? And then if it's a degree program that's been in place for several years, you kind of see a timeline of enrollments. And so I, I just want to share that with you for your reference as I want you to know that when you approve us to launch a new degree program, uh, we are monitoring that, we're tracking it, we're self-correcting when we think it's not achieving what we believe it's capable of achieving in terms of enrollments and, and actually graduating students with degrees. And we monitor that for several years. That table is kind of exhaustive. It's everything that we launched while there's still been a board. At some point, I'm gonna have to start rolling off degrees because the table will just get longer and longer. But any questions?
If not, I'll move on to the next agenda item. Our next four agenda items are policies. And uh, these are uh, proposed revisions to academic affairs policies. And the revisions to these four policies are primarily driven by changes that THEC made to their policies. And we are proposing revisions to our university policies to bring them in alignment with THEC requirements. So while we were doing that, we did a little cleanup at the same time. So maybe we corrected some language. We had legal counsel review the policies. So there were some other minor uh, revisions. But the, the major revisions that are being proposed are a direct result of changes that were made to THEC policies, and we need our policies to come into alignment with those. So I'll give a very brief description of, of each. So for policy 224, academic actions notification, THEC revised some of the criteria for universities notifying THEC about the establishment of certificate programs, so we made that change. THEC changed the requirements for universities uh, when we consolidate multiple academic programs down into one, they changed that from a notification to a modification request. So we have to get their approval. So that was taken out of this policy and added to a, a policy 226. Um, and finally, one significant proposed revision to this policy was the, is the addition of a requirement for the provost to present to the Board of Trustees as an informational item all of the academic actions that we notify to THEC. In practice, we've been doing that. Uh, the policy didn't require it, but I still give an uh, update every year on all those academic actions. But we're proposing to put it into the policy to require the provost office to do that. And so those are the revision, the, the major revisions to that policy. Very good. Thank you, Provost Bruce. This is an item that will require action, so I'll entertain a motion. I'll motion that we take policy 224 and uh, put it on the board's uh, give it to the board for approval via the consent agenda then. Okay. Motion by Trustee Wilmore. Seconded. Second by Trustee Luna. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. Secretary Ray, will you take the roll? Trustee Luna. Aye. Trustee Wilmore. Aye. Trustee Rose. Aye. Motion passes. Very good. Thank you. Policy 225, uh, proposed revisions are related to new academic programs. So as you, as you likely recall, when we propose a new academic degree program, it's a two-phase process. So we have the pre-proposal, which we call an LON, a letter of notification, and a full proposal, which we call a NAP, a new academic program proposal. And in the past, THEC required the Board of Trustees to approve both the pre-proposal and the full proposal. And this board delegated the approval of that pre-proposal to the Academic and Student Affairs Committee so that only the full proposal went to the full board. THEC changed their requirements to now only the full proposal goes to the board. Um, honestly, because feedback from, from me and other universities was that it was kind of causing confusion. When you, you keep, the board would feel like, well, didn't we already approve this? Well, that was the pre-proposal. And sometimes there can be six months, you know, between the full pre-proposal and the full proposal, and it does get a little confusing. So they removed that requirement, and we uh, mirrored that in our in our policy. But we did add to the policy the requirement that the provost office always bring the LON to the full board or to the board as an informational item so that the board is aware that we're working on a proposal, but, it, but we can move forward in a timely manner with developing the full proposal and then bring the full proposal, which has all the financials and all the details, and only bring that to the board for approval one time. 
Thank you, Provost Bruce. This, uh, this item will also require a, a motion second. I'll take it this time. Okay. I move to send policy 225 to the consent agenda. Okay, the motion's been properly made by Trustee Luna. Is there a second? There is, second. Very good. Thank you, Trustee Wilmore. Properly made and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Secretary Ray, will you call the roll? Trustee Luna. Aye. Trustee Wilmore. Aye. Trustee Rose. Aye. Motion passes. Very good. Provost Bruce, you got number three now. So for policy 226, academic program modifications, the proposed revisions are again to align Tennessee Tech's policy with THEC's requirements related to major modifications to academic programs. And uh, examples of the types of, of modifications that are included in this proposal would be, for example, if we were to change the degree designation. So maybe we were changing a, a Bachelor of Arts to a Bachelor of Fine Arts or changing a Bachelor of Art in History to a Bachelor of Science in History. Or we were and changing... those type of things come before the board or no? For so, approval? Uh, with, this, with this proposal, it will be an information. I will, we added in there a requirement for the provost office to always bring it to the board as an informational item. But, but, we, but, but the, before but this, changed some before of Before this, we were bringing this to the board, right? Before this policy, you would have brought that to the board for approval, right? Yes. Well, it was a mixture. Some required it, some didn't. This kind of cleans it up, and all of them will come to the board as an informational item. Um, and then, but I was bringing every, I, every one of those to the board, either for approval or as an informational item, already as a practice, uh, adding this language in the policy that requires the provost office to always bring it as an informational item, um, I feel is a safeguard to put into the policy. So, so the revisions so, are... So I guess, is, is that, is it, this is a, we, we think it's a good change? For, is that what you're... Yeah, I mean, for, it's, it's kind of a technical, I view it as more of a technical change. Um, you know, if we're changing a SIP code on a degree program, that, that's a fairly technical change. Um, uh, if we revise a curriculum, for example, one that I brought to the board uh, a couple of years ago was our uh, one of our degrees in the College of Business. We changed the SIP code because it was a very uh, data intensive uh, degree program. I believe it was in economics, and it was under a SIP code that was not a STEM SIP code. We we were we worked to get the curriculum revised so that we could put that degree program under a STEM SIP code, which is fairly technical, but it but from our perspective, it was meaningful to have a STEM degree um, in economics as we are a, a technological university. But those are kind of they're called major chain modifications, but Many of them are fairly technical modifications to our degree program. The one change in policy 226 is that THEC changed, if we were to consolidate two degree programs into one, that used to just be a notification to THEC. Now we have to go forward with a, we have to request approval from THEC. So it moved from that notification policy 224 and now is in this policy 226. So just so I'm understanding the policy correctly, if we propose changing something like a BS to a BA or a BA to a BS, that would go to THEC for, for review and approval. Yes. Right, so it, it will get rigorously reviewed, oh, yes. but yes. then it would come here as an information item. Correct. Okay. And so we are relinquishing the board's authority for those type of decisions based on this policy. Is that right? Yes. And we're okay with that. I asked the question. I don't know all the details. I, I'm okay Nobody. with it, only because THEC is going to provide such a rigorous review that I'm not sure that I would be always qualified as a board member to review a program, but I recognize that THEC would have the expertise to review it. And so that, that's the part that makes me more comfortable with it. 
Yeah, I understand we don't have that expertise to review it, but we, at least we have the opportunity to ask questions. And it sounds like now that we are just going to get information and we really wouldn't. And maybe that's okay. And that, that's my question. I, uh, I don't have strong feelings about it one way or the other. I certainly would uh, uh, bow to the board's disposition about this. I mean, we can bring them for approval. Some of them are very minor in nature, uh, fairly trivial. Uh, some might not be quite so trivial. Uh, and, and to be honest, I guess my thinking has changed a little bit on this because there's uh, I, there's some movement at the state level about what THEC's role in all this is going to be in the future. Uh, and so that, uh, you know, well, that, well, that changes we, my thinking a little bit too. We used to have a board of regents, right? And we went to a board of trustees to, so the trustees could oversee the specifics of this university or the specifics of the given universities. And it sounds like in this case, THEC is going to make some decisions that normally we would make, and maybe that's okay in this setting. I just want to make sure that that's just, the case. Just a question about it. Is this, as I read it, an alignment with new THEC policy? So they, is it as if they're requiring us to do it and we're, no? They, they changed their policy to, to not require us to take it to the board and so we just aligned our policy with their policy. But if we wanted to keep the decision at the board level, we could. Absolutely. Absolutely. The one, and that's my question. Yeah, Do the, we want that? And I, I, don't, I don't have enough information to make the call myself. I don't know. That's why I'm asking the question. I mean, I don't, I don't have strong feelings one way or the other. The pro, to me, pros and cons are uh, some of the things like changing SIP codes, changing uh, degree designations, um, you know, they're, they're fairly technical. Uh, others are not. So, for example, uh, pulling out a concentration and standing up a new degree program is not technical. Um, but... Uh, if that so, but the the to balance that positive and negative, it also if you're wanting to move forward on something, it it, it can slow down the process, which could be good or could be bad, but it slow down the process by waiting to the next quarterly meeting to move forward on an on an action on an academic program. What's the most efficient thing, though, for the university? I mean, is this something you would prefer to go to THEC for those rather than waiting for board meetings, or would you, you prefer it here? I mean, I, I, think it, I think it really boils down to what's the most efficient process for the university. The most efficient is, to, is, to, is what's being proposed in this policy in that uh, the items would come here as informational items. That way we can go ahead and take action on things and bring it as an informational item. You know, if we were to take an action on something uh, and bring it to the board and we had feedback that that wasn't what we needed to do, obviously we would take corrective action on that. So technically, if you brought an information item to the board and the board decided, oh, well, we really don't want to do that, we could make a motion and stop it. Yes. So could we suggest then a friendly amendment that it's presented as an informational item prior to submission to THEC? Since it's... I think then you lose the efficiency. I, th I think... And I'll point out, let me just say from my, from my experience on this board, making amendments to policies from this seat are, is not a good idea. Jay, now, I'm not suggesting we don't need to make changes to the policy. I'm just saying we don't want to do it saying, oh, we would like it to be this way, because it really needs to go back through the people that have reviewed it. So I'm not opposed to making an amendment, but I just don't think you can make a, what, it's not like I say, let's give us all a, a raise of 100% of our salary, which would be a, still a zero. I could say that, and we could all make an amendment to it, but something that's had this kind of review, I don't think we would want to do that without some further review. 
mean, if the committee, if the committee feels strongly about it, we can table this policy and bring it back, I believe. We'll be okay um, to bring that back at the next so that we can have more, you know, thought about that and get more feedback from each of you uh, and bring it back at the next board meeting. Well, the other point is that it will come up regularly for review every four years. So if we see something yes. that we identify as, gosh, we really should have approved that, we'll have another opportunity to modify the policy. Uh, Beyond even every four years. I mean, if, if you decided a year from now or six months from now, oh, we made a mistake, you can come back to the board and say, please revise this policy at any time. Yes. I mean, we're required to review the policy every four years, but we review this policy more often. I don't even think we're on a four-year rotation right now. We, were, we went through the revisions because of the THEC changes. So uh, Trustee Jones is correct. I mean, if we went with the policy in this form and realized, you know, in the next year, well, that's not working the way we wanted it to, uh, the, bo the board could request me to bring the policy back through the review again. Just as a general comment, I mean, it seems like this is something that that the provost needs to do for efficiency of these managing these projects or these programs in the university. And because of that, I would certainly support it. I guess the only reason there's some hesitation, in my opinion, is that it seems as if we're shifting some authority back to THEC away from the board. But I, again, I think you have to not make the decision based on that basis or fear, make it on on the efficiency of what, what it makes sense to do for the university. And so I would say move ahead. If you, at some point, the board or the provost decides, well, we shouldn't have done it this way, then we change it. And, and there's nothing that would prohibit me from bringing an item to the board if I thought it was a significant modification. It's not just a degree designation or a, a SIP code change. We're really going to do a significant modification. There would be nothing that would prohibit me from bringing that to the board before taking it to THEC. Let me ask a real basic question. Trustee Luna, what gives you the confidence that THEC can act appropriately? So it's actually not the confidence in THEC, it's the confidence in the provost and the president, right? And the fact that they're identifying programs that they want to move forward with. And so I don't think that having been on the side of, we're, we're going through a concentration name change right now, right? And so I'm doing the paperwork for that. And I understand that those types of changes, they go through multiple um, committees, they go through our academic affairs, or excuse me, academic council, they go through all of these committees with faculty before they even get to the president or the provost, before they could ever be submitted to THEC. So I feel like, in my opinion, there's enough stops along the way that I'm okay that maybe the board is not an additional stop. And by the time that we submit something to THEC, I expect that it would have already, if it's big, it would have already been presented here anyway, but also it's going to have so many eyes on it that I feel comfortable with it. We have plenty of local eyes on it. That's what you're saying. Okay. Thanks. And does THEC act pretty quickly when you... Yes, they do. Good discussion. Any any other comments or questions? I'll just wrap it up. I just want to make sure that we are not relinquishing authority that we need to have over this university. Uh, and it sounds like, based on the discussion, that uh, in most instances, that that this change would not affect that. Uh, and where it might affect it, then we can step in and and intercede if we needed to. That's what I'm hearing. Is that right? Yes. And, and while we're relinquishing that authority a little bit, we can pull it back. Exactly. Okay. Thanks. Could, I appreciate the discussion. Uh, Dr. Bruce, help me make sure I'm getting this right. Because we're kind of lumping in a lot of different possibilities here, right? I mean, it could be as trivial as a, as a name change to an existing program, or it could be uh, a totally new program, uh, a, a totally new department, college, whatever, we're not talking about that. No. Okay, but we are talking about potentially a new program. The one item in the policy that falls under this category is 
uh, creating the, the most significant one is taking an existing concentration that we would pull out and have as a standalone degree program. In those cases, okay. we have to have years of data to show sustained enrollment, the resources are in place, and previously when we've done that, it's, it's required no new resources. It, yeah. mm -hmm. And so that is the most, in, in my professional opinion, the most significant item in the list of major modifications is pulling a concentration out to be a standalone degree program. But that does not include new departments mm -hmm. or colleges or just <clears throat> launching a new program. It does not include any Okay, so, so it would only, the most significant would be taking a, an existing concentration and ele elevating it to a new program uh, what I would suggest is that as you as actually as you should suggested that we just make a practice of bringing those specifically to the board for approval and and all the others that would be considered more editorial or trivial in nature that we would follow this policy and I think that would probably satisfy everybody Okay, then I would move to send policy 226 to the board's consent agenda based on the comments that the president just made. Seconded. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Wilmore, for the motion. Trustee Luna for the second. Any other discussion? Comments? Secretary Ray? Trustee Luna? Aye. Trustee Wilmore? Aye. Trustee Rose. Aye. Motion carries. Very good. Thank you. And I think you have one more now, Provost Bruce. Yes. Policy 227, and that's in tab 8 of your board book. And this is uh, the policy new academic units. And the revisions are being proposed to ensure that our policy it is in alignment with THEC policy a 1.3, also named New Academic Unit Policies. Um, these revisions clarify the approval processes for establishing new academic uh, units and um, I don't have my glasses on to read my notes, sorry. And this does require board approval. So if we were to, for example, create a new academic department, this does require board approval. And uh, that was not altered in any way, but the language in the policy was uh, revised to clarify the process. Uh, for example, in the past, it didn't have language about what if we brought it to the board and the board suggested revisions. There wasn't anything in the policy to address that. And so uh, most of the, the, the revisions, the significant revisions in this policy are really about clarifying the processes, the approval processes. But this one does retain board, it still requires board approval to uh, create a new academic unit. Thank you, Provost Bruce. I'll entertain a motion. I move to send policy 227 to the consent agenda. Thank you, Trustee Luna. Have a Second. proper motion. Second. Second from Trustee Wilmore. Any discussion, comments, questions? Secretary Ray, will you call uh, the roll? I do have one question, okay. please, Mr. Chairman. Thank yes, yes, sir. Uh, it looks like to me on uh, page two, uh, policy Roman numeral five, that it says that the um, the establishment of a new unit, academic unit, or modification to an existing academic unit at Tennessee Tech must go undergo the following institutional, and it marks out the Tennessee Tech Board of Trustees approval process. So for a new academic unit. I thought that was going to come before the board, but according to the changes made, it marks us out, the Tennessee Tech Board of Trustees, approval has been marked out, and it has to go uh, to the 
president, the provost's office, and just a clarification up in item number two, it defines the board of trustees as the board. So where you're referring to, it's simply removing the words board of trustees again and replacing it with the board. The board does mean the board of trustees. Yes, I mean, the marked up, the redlined version is so, <laughs> to me, it's hard to follow. If you look at the non-redlined version, the clean version, and you look at section 5B, and then it steps 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the, the, the 5 is where uh, the request is brought to the board for review and approval. Okay, thank you. Good discussion, and uh, thank you all both for paying close attention to that, but good point. Any other discussion questions? Okay, Secretary Ray, will you call the roll, please, sir? Trustee Luna. Aye. Trustee Wilmore. Aye. Trustee Rose. Aye. Motion carries. Very good. Thank you, Provost Bruce. You did that very efficiently and effectively. Thank you very much. Well, we're honored today that we have John Lou with us live and in person, and welcome to Tennessee Tech. I hope you're loving it thus far. He's going to give us an update on the research and economic development, and glad to have you with us. Thank you, uh, Chair Rose. Uh, honorable trustees, first of all, let me share with you how happy my family and I are to come home here in Tennessee Tech. I use the word home not lightly, being the first generation immigrant. Perhaps Trustee Wilmore can share with us similar feelings when you were in space. Uh, I, we truly mean the Southeast coming back to Southeast. We have been to Midwest, uh, Northeast, and Southeast. Uh, we regard the southeast part of the states truly like home. And coming back to tech, it's truly coming home. So I would like you to know that because we're very, very happy to, uh, and we are grateful uh, to you to give me the opportunity to serve as a VP for research here at tech. Uh, before this is a, th because this is my first meeting with the trustees, I would like to share a little bit of my background, but there are two messages from this picture. One, that uh, education, college education is a game changer. Secondly, research is the accelerator. So you can see that's my home. So I grew up in the cave, uh, shown in the picture of six siblings of, my, of mine, and. Uh, uh, I say edu college education is a game changer. Three of us made it to the college. We're doing great. Three of my siblings did not make it to the college. They are still in that poor village, living in the caves. Of course, I understand that's not a perfect biological experiment, no controls, but the point is clear. Uh, a little bit of my background, I did my college education in China. Uh, in Northwest Agricultural College, studying plant pathology. Did my graduate education at the University of Minnesota, uh, studying in plant pathology with master's and PhD in cell molecular biology. After that, I served uh, for 22 years in various capacities at Auburn University in Alabama, so uh, including serving as faculty, Center Director, Associate Dean for Research, Associate Provost, and Associate Vice President for Research. So in 2017, uh, you know, I get a phone call to apply for a job in Syracuse, and which I did, and uh, then initially served as its VPR. Then I was called upon to step in as Interim Provost, and after that serve as VP for International Strategy very briefly before I came on board October 1st. Obviously, I'm a researcher. You can say I'm not going to talk about those numbers. Uh, I still love my research, carried along that research till this day uh, as I serve as VP uh, as well. I feel that's uh, important for me to understand what fact is living through, the hardships, the barriers, and so on. So 
uh, that, uh, that, that I continue to do. Now, uh, I said the education is important, college education, and said research is very important for students. I would like to use my experience in the, you know, the last 30 years, what I got from all the professors, all the universities, back, return that back to our students. I said tech is like a family because we are, uh, we are very, uh, we have very high uh, proportion of rural students. Uh, you know, they are not sort of rural, as rural as my background, but I relate to their experience with mine so that I can enhance research to enhance their future. So I think that's a, it's very important. Uh, obviously, I'm still learning, so I need to, uh, as I, you know, as we go along, we would, uh, I would know more exactly what uh, to do to grow the research enterprise, but some initial thoughts. The first is to increase proportion of research active faculty. Uh, that can be done much easier at the time of failure. Uh, because we have been a regional university, so to speak, focusing mostly on teaching some research, but since 2017, our research has more than doubled in the last six years in terms of research expenditures. So that's very terrific. It's the right time to come here to join the tech family. But when we do the new hairs, we need to clearly state that expectation. All new hairs of faculty, they will be expected to develop a nationally competitive research program. That's uh, expectation is extremely important. The secondly is to really align their interests with societal challenges. We got to be relevant. When you do research, you are solving real world problems. Somebody more than tech is interested in such things. They're willing to put their dollars on the table to support such research. So I think that's very, very important. Obviously, we have existing faculty. Some may never want to be research active again. Fair enough. But for those who want to be research active, uh, my office, we will do everything to support them to transition into research active faculty again. The second area is to increase research of research active faculty. When you look at one year data versus three year data, you see a big difference. That means some faculty members are on and off over time. So we need to really encourage them to write more grant proposals, uh, get larger research projects, such that projects are overlapped and sustained, that will grow the overall university research enterprise uh, for sure. And then increase uh, teamwork. In today's research environment, individuals can do something, but not very big things. Large societal global challenge requires collaboration. So we're going to bring folks together to bring larger projects, not only just money, but also reputation to tech. Lastly, uh, research infrastructure. I'm talking about both hard research in infrastructure and soft research in infrastructure. Hard, we're talking about facilities, equipment, buildings, and the like. But soft ones are also important. Processes, those barriers, departments, schools, people cannot work together so efficiently, and so on. So we'll focus on both soft and hard infrastructure, such that we can grow the enterprise at tech. With that, I'll be very happy to answer any questions you may have. And real quickly on number three there, um, are you talking about leveraging based on your collaborations, or is there more to that leveraging? Very good uh, question, uh, Trustee Wilmore. Uh, the, uh, it's a lot. It's, it's both. It's really uh, looking at our funding distributions. Uh, you know, you get all sorts of different funding agencies. You get all sorts of mechanisms of funding like uh, appropriations versus competitive grants and so on. We do have a few centers, but we need to leverage the centers and bring in more folks. That's one side of the meaning. The other, when we have state very valuable state resources in here, local resources. 
we need to leverage that local resources to bring in larger federal, particularly federal and other industry funding to grow the research in the press. Very good. Thank you. I would just add one to this wonderful list. It's very, well, first of all, it's very exciting to have you here. Welcome. And it was wonderful to meet you to begin with. And I'm so glad you're at Tech. Um, one that I'd, I'd love to also for you to consider is um, maybe building a bridge across all disciplines, right? We, we are a very STEM-focused institution, but just in this past week, you know, one of our English faculty published a book, and we want to make sure that we celebrate those types of things, even though they may not bring in the big federal dollars, right? But building that bridge across all our disciplines to recognize the great research in all colleges here at Tech. Excellent comment, uh, Trustee Luna. Uh, when we use the word research, I need to uh, explain a little bit. Uh, here, we I seem to focus on the extramural funding. That is important, but it's a research input. Most often, extramural funding are more uh, concentrated with STEM areas, but we do have many faculty members working with arts, social sciences, humanities, and other creative uh, research areas. So, so we want to value and appreciate all research forms. Yes, I, indeed, there's a book of poetry that published by our English professor. I sent a memo to her right away yesterday to say, I want to congratulate you on such achievements. Please keep up the great work. I, I really think your comment is extremely important because we need to bring all faculty along that uh, who not only you know, grew our research enterprise, but impact our students and society as a whole. Any other questions or comments? Dr. Lee, great presentation. And again, welcome. Oh, Trustee just, Jones has just, comment. Just a brief comment. I really feel strongly about research and uh, how it does need to continue to be increased at the university. And I, and I just want to make a comment that People often view research dollars as something as, you know, needed to bring funding to the university. And to me, that's not really the motivation for it. To me, and the motivation is to keep the university on the cutting edge of, and I think of a technology because I'm an engineer, but it's to keep the university relevant in all aspects of our changing world. And without research, you fail to do that. Um, so I, I think it's critically important. Thank you for your efforts, and I hope that the research programs continue to grow. Thank you. Yes, Tracy Jones, your comment is extremely important because I always feel research itself is important, but it's not for the sake of research. As a university, it's so important for our enrollment. Nowadays, students will look at university research, the buildings and others, hardware, software, to determine which university campuses that are coming. That's the first. Secondly, it's so important so crucially important to the success of students. The soft skills, the experiential learning, hands-on experience and so on, will bring their success. That I have not seen many employers ask, what's your GPA when they hear our graduates, but rather they interview you to see how you can communicate, how you organize your thoughts together, can you solve problems and so on. All these soft skills can be learned through research. And in the long term, it determines the success of our university. Our success is not going to be measured by the dollar amount. You are absolutely right. It's going to be measured by the quality and success of our graduates. Dr. Liu, hello over here. <laughs> Sorry, it's hard to know where it's coming from. So we're, we're very fortunate to have you here. Do you, do you go personally and visit with all the professors and department heads, if, because your uh, enthusiasm is infectious. So I think, and I know email is great and, and Zoom and so forth, but you personally going to visit and meeting everybody, I think would really support what you're trying to do. Thank you, Trustee Lian. Yes, we, we're, I'm visiting as fast as I can with the Department of Colleges. Very good comments. 
I, I liked the fact, too, that you started by that it was good to be home. And I think we all know that uh, home's where the heart is, and there's no place like home. And so it makes us feel good to know that you think of this as home, because I think that'll show that you'll be very successful here. So welcome home. Welcome home. Okay, next we're going to go to Christina Mick, and it's time for the uh, annual update on uh, the Center Update for Mental Health Services. So, did I skip something here? Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Trustee Rose. I'm just here to introduce Dr. Mick. Okay. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, we're doing great work in the Division of Student Affairs, and today Dr. Mick will be uh, giving you some data on our programs and services offered through the Counseling Center. She does this on an annual basis, so this is very important to the work uh, of the university, but also uh, at the state level, um, and so that the board can hear updates on what's working uh, at Tennessee Tech. So without further ado, Dr. Mick will come forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pope Johnson, and um, thank you to the board for uh, allowing me the opportunity to give you the annual Counseling Center update on mental health services. Um, I'm happy to report that um, I would say 3.5% of the university is using the services, and we're doing some great work up there. Um, before I dive into the data, I would like to set uh, some perspective and some context for you of uh, kind of where our students are coming from in terms of their youth before coming to college. Um, for example, we <clears throat> live in what we call a pre-post-COVID world, if you will. Um, and pre-COVID, we did have a lot of students increase in coming to the Counseling Center for Anxiety and Depression. That was in pre-COVID. Um, COVID, we've seen a little dip because the students were at home. Uh, we did provide services virtually to them. And then post-COVID, we are in a national college-wide uh, mental health pandemic. And the numbers that you're going to see are going to reflect that. But let me also just add, um, not to sound gloom and doom, but our students grew up in a pandemic. Most of them were in high school during those years. They've lived in a world of natural disasters mass shootings, wars, systemic racism, and increased screen time. And when I say increased screen time, I'm not just meaning scrolling through social media. They live in the comments section uh, of social media that's had an impact on their mental health over the years. And this has led them to relentless amounts of trauma. And if trauma is not dealt with, it can lead to mental health issues. So the numbers you are going to see are going to reflect kind of what I've described to you. So please keep that in mind as we go through the data. The first slide that's represented here is the number of unique students that receive services at the Counseling Center per academic year over the last 16 years that we've been keeping data. If you'll notice, 2021-2022, uh, there was 862 students. This is when we came back from COVID. And then the full-on, full-year um, Last year, 2022, 2023, we had an increase up to 1,043 students that uh, utilized services at the Counseling Center. That reflects a 21% increase from 2021, 2022 to academic year 2022, 2023. What's a unique student? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What is a unique student? A unique student is identified through our electronic medical records that anyone that checks in, checks themselves into the counseling center. And then that data is tracked through the electronic medical records. So if I was one student, but I contacted you five times, that would be five people on this list. Is that correct? Not necessarily, no. That would be, uh, if you contacted the center five times, that would be five different sessions or five different contacts that's tracked differently. But it, you'd be one unique student. That's, that's the definition of one unique student is 
you are the student and you've had 10 sessions or whatever. So in this case, we've got 1,043 in the year 25, 22, 25, 22, 23, um, 1,043 different students at think, Tennessee Tech contacted. Are them. those sessions or are those students, Dr. Brown? Those are students. The next slide is the number of sessions. So are they 1,043 of our tech students came to see you, not one person coming five times would equal five of those? Yes, we had 1,043 separate students Thank come you. to the counseling center. The next slide is the number of counseling sessions per academic year for the last 16 years. So for 2021, 2022, we had 2,064 sessions. And then at the c conclusion of last academic year, 2022, 2023, we had 2,492 sessions. Um, so for each student, they may have multiple sessions. Those were tracked through the electronic medical records and the data reflected 2,492, which again is a 21% increase in usage of the counseling center from academic year 2021-2022 to 2022-2023. Um, and I will add here that we are now fully staffed. Uh, we had, we've had four uh, staff retire or move to a different department internally. And so now 2022-2023, uh, we're fully staffed with uh, six licensed counselors, one admin, one uh, GA. The GA is a doctoral level student who is under supervision and sees clients. And then we have uh, a, one of the licensed counselors is, is a, a new position that we put into place in 2021-2022, and that's a clinical coordinator. The clinical coordinator helps us with first-time appointments, uh, crisis walk-ins, um, supportive check-in appointments. I'll explain a little bit about those in a different slide, but those are short uh, kind of check-in appointments and does a lot of follow-up and tracking, referrals, and care navigation for the department. That, that case management piece frees up our counselors to do more one-on-one -on -one time with students that come into the center. Can I, ask, can I ask just a quick, quick question? The, uh, in, the numbers that, you, that we see for students, how does that compare to the broader society and in, in just as far as the percentage of folks that are receiving services and the increase that we've seen post-COVID? Are, are college students more susceptible or, or, is it, or just that's just where we are from, from a societal standpoint? Um, from a societal standpoint, the short answer is this is where we're at. Um, I think tech's doing a fantastic job. Of course, we do have some gaps in service and there's some things we can do to, to serve our students from a mental health perspective. But um, I will say that I do have some national and state numbers for you uh, on another slide so I can give you some uh, comparison. Um, but just to jump ahead a little bit to tell you how well we're doing in, in most areas is, um, you know, each year I report on this and I typically get a question about substance use. You know, how, how, how is that addressed here on the university? So at uh, a national state level, um, I want to tell you the proper number. At the state level, um, according to the Healthy Mind Study, 60% of university students are using alcohol. At Tennessee Tech University, I don't have that data per se of how many students are using alcohol, but I can tell you we see a handful of students at the Counseling Center for anything substance use related. So I can tell you as far as prevention goes, we're doing fantastic. Um, as far as some of the other issues that are nationwide, we're doing very well, um, as you will see in some of the numbers going forward. I hope that answers your question. I just had a question. Looking at the first two charts, um, for example, 1920, you had, or let's say 1819, you had 600 students, but yet that year, 1819, you also had the most counseling sessions. Is it, I mean, I'm assuming that this data would be somewhat skewed by 
the capacity of the counseling center. So, you know, if you had enough counselors, maybe all of these numbers would have been higher. And in some years, due to limitations of capacity, you, your numbers may be lower. So can you, can you just generally give us some idea of how much your counseling capacity has affects these numbers? In other words, if you had enough counselors, would these numbers be much higher? Actually, I think that's an absolute excellent question. And this is a conversation that I had most recently with Dr. Pope Johnson is we cannot out, we can't outstaff the issue. If we had um, 10 more counselors and the students knew about it, they would come and come and come and come because we're in a nationwide national mental health pandemic. Um, I think if we added more staff, which I do think we need, um, I think we need to be real strategic about how those were, would be used. Um, but the students, what they really, really have expressed to us and what they've shown us through the data is they want on-demand services. They want to be seen in the moment right now. And so we may have six or eight counselors a day and uh, or six or eight walk-ins a day with them sitting out in the lobby waiting. And if we had more counselors in that moment, they would be they would be coming and coming and coming. So I don't think we can outstaff the issue. I think we just have to be strategic. So to go back to your capacity question, we do have some things in, in place that I will speak about to expand the capacity. Um, but we've, we've had six counselors for quite a while. Um, if you will see in 2020-21 when we, w we were all working virtually, of course there was a dip. Um, the other thing I would point out on capacity um, in 2015, uh, the Counseling Center was awarded a $280,000 suicide prevention grant, and it was a three-year grant. And we received lots of funding and resources and programming from that grant. So if you'll look at 2015, 2016, 2017, although we did have a climb, it wasn't a big climb until the grant ended. Now, I'm not saying the ending of the grant caused the increase in students, but we were able to kind of be more stable when we had more funding and more resources in place during the grant period. I'd, I'd also like to jump in from a student perspective here and say that the Counseling Center has all of these services, like Dr. Mick said, on demand, um, but they are booked for those current appointments to until January right now. Like a student, if I went in right now, I wouldn't be able to get an appointment until January, correct? That's correct. We're booking appointments at the end of January right now. We stay um, four weeks out for um, follow-up appointments and initial appointments are six weeks out. So we do not have enough capacity as it is right now. Yes. Do you have the capacity to respond if you feel, or any system in place to respond if you if you feel there's a student in dire need, I mean, risk of suicide, that kind of thing? Um, yes, we have an on-call counselor every day. So every day of the week, we have an on-call on counselor from 8 to 4.30. And we tell students, you don't have to have an appointment to be seen at the counseling center. Ideally, that's nice to have an appointment, but anybody can walk in and be seen on, on demand immediately in the moment at the counseling center. Now, if our on-call counselor's in with someone else, you may have to wait in the lobby a little bit, but we do make sure that everybody is seen and taken care of and they're safe. Dr. Mick, it's reassuring to me to hear what you said about the substance abuse and that it's not as severe as we might think that it could be in other areas. But I heard a discussion the other day about the, the long-term impact of the pandemic, and particularly on the students that were high school juniors and seniors at the time that, that occurred. And the discussion was that the junior year of high school is, is kind of like the bellwether weather tipping point in high school. And that that's where students develop that emotional maturity, the resilience, the the, the capacity to deal with stress and problems, the junior year of high school more than, than probably any other year. And those students that missed their junior year of high school missed that educational component of life. So they're now in college. Are you seeing the impact of that in, in a way that's, that's obvious to you all in the counseling center that 
that they didn't go through that experience their junior year of high school. Now they're in college and, and struggling with it. I think that's an excellent comment. And one that should be noted is that what we are seeing at the counseling center and what is reflected nationwide is uh, some loneliness, lack of connection, and social anxiety. The American College Counseling Association, uh, I went to their conference in March, and they listed nationwide the top three issues that college, count, uh, college students are experiencing is um, uh, social anxiety, and we are seeing that. The students are coming in wanting to connect, but they're little uh, anxious about it. Um, but according to the Healthy Mind study that I'll reference again, uh, number three for the state and number three nationwide was loneliness. I think that loneliness and social anxiety can be correlated uh, together when we're talking about the pandemic and how the students uh, receive the pandemic on a social and a connectiveness level. But I will say this, that's not one of the top six reasons they come to the Counseling Center at Tennessee Tech. They do come for that. Um, but that is not one of the top six uh, reasons. They do want to be connected. Um, but a as, I've, as I've mentioned, I think when we have programs and, and events on campus, such as lighting up the quad, that fosters engagement. The students learn how to be more social. They learn how to engage. And they're more mentally well and confident and resilient. And then, therefore, they're able to be successful on campus. I'll jump in there too because I graduated high school during COVID so I was the 2020 year that got everything cut short and then I've seen kind of the impacts of that fall below um, I guess but Tennessee Tech did a really great job when we came here whereas other universities that my friends went to did not of engaging students safely during COVID and giving us those opportunities to connect. Um, and not to say that students are not still impacted because obviously by these numbers and by the counseling center, um, like numbers increasing, um, students are obviously still impacted by the pandemic, definitely impacted me, definitely impacted many of my classmates. But um, Tennessee Tech did a great job of when we came to college, we still had that connection whereas students at other universities did not. Um, and so I, I think that's important too to keep in mind for our purposes when we talk about students who had these experience during the pandemic of tech students might be different from the broader college student community in the sense of we did get lighting of the quad my freshman year. We did get these events that other universities didn't get to have that help improve that college experience and mental health there. Let, let me drill down on something you mentioned about substance abuse and alcohol and so forth. And then I th thought you said we we're very fortunate we're not following the norm or the status quo with maybe other colleges or other or society. Uh, is that what I heard? And if that's the case, why why are we doing so much better? <clears throat> um, yes, that is what I I had mentioned, um, and that is just based on students reporting at the counseling center. Now there may be some things going on that's not reported. But based on what we see at the counseling centers, we see maybe four or five students a semester for anything substance use related. Um, and I think we do a really good job of two things. Prevention, prevention work. Like I said, we got a $280,000 grant in 2015 to 2018. And our counseling center used that to fo focus on prevention. So, and I think Dr. Steven Seiler just got uh, a prevention grant well out of the uh, sociology department. So we do a great job of prevention. The other thing that I would add, again, circling back, is I think we do, as a university, a really good job of engaging our students uh, and supporting our students. I mean, um, the lighting up the quad, we do a phenomenal job at Week of Welcome. Uh, engaging the students, the new freshmen coming in, alerting them to all the new programs, and then we put on events. We had the event in downtown Cookville this year where we engaged uh, students and collaborated with the city of Cookville to show our students that they're supported. I think that helps with the social anxiety, the loneliness, fostering a sense of connection where students don't feel like they need to rely on substances to feel like they need to be successful. So we're doing our part, it sounds like. But I guess we can also credit maybe the type of students that, that are attracted to Tennessee Tech, that they're more serious and they're here for maybe more than just for what they can get out of it, but what, what they can put into it. 
I think that's an excellent comment, and I will follow that with um, some data I was working on actually last week. I don't know if you're, and I don't want to open uh, another can of worms, but I don't know if you're familiar with the adverse childhood experiences uh, survey or scoring that's uh, done a lot of times in um, counseling centers or health centers. Um, but we we give each we, we give the students that come to the counseling center an opportunity to take that ACEs score, and an ACEs score is scored from one to ten. The higher, the closer you get to ten, the the higher you're going to have health issues predicted. You're going to have health issues down the road. So I ran the data. I wanted to see how our students were doing. And uh, out of 77 ACEs scores from last year, uh, the average score was two. So that tells me our students are resilient. Um, our students have grit, and that's a term that comes from Dr. Uh, Angela Duckworth, who's done a lot of research on resilience and grit. And so, yes, the, the students that are coming to Tech are resilient. And I will add, maybe some of the reason the numbers or highs because they feel comfortable coming to ask for support and help at this community, uh, campus community where they feel supported and engaged and feel like we can give them the support they need to continue to be resilient and have the grit that they need to be successful on campus. I want to, I know we need to move on because you have a lot of slides here and I'm, I'm excited to see some of, not, maybe excited is not the right word, but I want to see some of this other data, but I think building on what Trustee Lynn just said, our students are self-selecting this university because we are that small town university, right? If you want the big football games, the drinking, and the sometimes we think like, we wish we had more Greek life. Maybe it's good that we don't have a super active Greek life system because our students stay really focused on their academics. So um, I'm proud of our students for how they're scoring on those things that they they are, they're feeling safe and they're coming to the counseling center. They're seeking help when they know they need help. I think those are good signs. Thank you for that comment. That's an excellent comment. And, um, and like I said, 3.5% 3, 3 of the university is using the counseling center. And I know that's going to, to increase as we go forward. The next slide is the monthly distribution of amount of appointments for months from uh, 2016 to 2023. The reason 2020, uh, 2016 is listed here is because that's when we uh, started keeping the data on electronic medical records. We first got those in 2016. So I ran this distribution from 2016 through, let me just say, mid-semester of this academic year. So this is through October 19th, 2023. So as you would expect, the majority of the appointments that we receive at the counseling center are uh, about six weeks into each semester, and then they go down during breaks, and they go down during the summer. Um, I will tell you that during the summer, we are very busy as a, as a counseling center team with SOAR. We give presentations at SOAR. We have several open houses. Uh, actually, we have an open house every single SOAR session, so students who are interested uh, to coming t up to the counseling center and seeing it and meeting the counselors personally and in a private space can do so. We also use those summer months um, to maintain our licensure requirements, so we have to do trainings and workshops to maintain our licensure, and we do that in the majority of time in the summertime. I'm sorry, looking at this slide, is that just the months in alphabetical order? My what? Um, those are distributed um, by alphabetical order. Again, the next slide is distribution of visit types by amount of appointments for academic year 
2022-2023 in blue, and then up through this academic year through mid-semester, October 19th, 2023. And so I would like to explain the type of appointments that students come for. Again, students do not have to have an appointment to come to the Counseling Center. They can walk in anytime from 8 to 4.30 and be seen uh, immediately. And then, of course, we have our after-hours crisis hotline uh, that we activate at 4.30. Um, holidays, weekends, any gaps that the universities close, the students have access to a counselor. Um, but we have intake appointments, which are first-time appointments. We have follow-up appointments. Those are regular appointments um, that students can make after an intake appointment. We have crisis walk-ins, um, where a student just can walk in either for that they're in crisis or they need a rapid access, and I'll explain what a rapid access is. They have supportive check-ins. Again, those are 15, 20-minute appointments that students can engage with our clinical coordinator in between appointments. Like I said, right now, to get an appointment is four weeks, um, but our clinical coordinator has space for students to schedule if they need something in between, just a little supportive check-in. And then the non-FTF, those are non-face-to-face -face contacts. Those are collateral contacts. Those are phone calls, secure messages, um, things to provide continuity of care for student care. Um, so I'll circle back to the crisis walk-ins. Um, so up to October 19th, we've had 137. Of those 137, 46 appointments are called, we call those rapid access appointments. So rapid access appointments are 30 minute, non-urgent, targeted topic appointments that the student comes to us and may want to process something. Um, and we will, work, we will meet with them and support them and work through that 30 minute appointment with them. Um, the other appointments were uh, actual crisis appointments. And we defined a mental health crisis as a student who we feel is in danger of harming themselves or someone else. Um, they may have had some sort of immediate trauma and they need support, or they're not able to function or go to class. And so in those circumstances, we have a crisis counselor available to meet with them immediately, and then we will get them the help that they need, whether that's on campus or off campus. The most important thing is to make sure the student is safe and taken care of in terms of what they need for treatment so that they're able to get back to their academic success and student success. The next slide is the number of psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner visits, June 2021 through, again, mid-semester, October 19th, 2023. So just to give a little history, um, June of 2021, the Board of Trustees um, uh, passed that the Counseling Center could contract with a mental health nurse practitioner to work with our students on campus. And so that in June of 2021, we advertised, we did a search, we hired someone, um, trained them, and then got them set up in our electro electronic medical records to see clients. And then they started seeing clients July of 2022. And as you can see in orange, um, the psych med visits and the psych evals have been very successful. Um, we, as a matter of fact, the, she is uh, working today. She works one day a week. Two, two days out of the month on campus and two days of the month she works uh, virtually. She works 10 hours a week. She, uh, as per the board uh, approval, she does not prescribe any antipsychotics. She does not prescribe any narcotics. She does not prescribe ADHD medicine. She prescribes a mild antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medicine based on the need of students. And this is brief psychiatric care. This is not long-term. So if anyone needs long-term, we refer them off campus to make sure they get the treatment that they need. Um, I guess our, our motto is making sure that they're stable and able. And when they're stable and able, they uh, come off the medication under the care of the psychiatric nurse practitioner. Um, she also has supervision. She meets with Dr. Cynthia Rector once a month um, to staff her cases. 
and get supervision from her. And then she meets at the end of her day with our clinical coordinator and they coordinate care together for our students that come through the Counseling Center for Brief Psychiatric Care. So it's been a very successful program thus far and I see it continuing to be successful. <clears throat> the next slide is uh, describing or reflecting our Mantra Health resource. Um, Mantra Health is a new resource that we got in 2022. The idea, we're talking about expanding capacity, the idea of purchasing or contracting with Mantra Health was to expand the capacity of our existing services to our underserved students. And some of these underserved students may include non-traditional students, our athletes, um, sometimes our education, major, education major, majors, excuse me, um, can't come because they're student teaching during the day. Um, and some students just prefer telehealth. And so we got this service to fill those um, needs. It's a telehealth service. Um, it also provides medication management under the parameters of our other psychiatric nurse practitioner. Um, thus far, uh, from October 19th, we had had 31 signups. I'm happy to report that um, as of this week, we've had 51 total signups, 40 of those for counseling and 11 of those for medication management. And Mantra has provided us 56 therapy sessions this fall, which has been a really um, helpful thing for, this, for the student body. Um, the student satisfaction rate for Mantra Health is 4.8 out of five stars as they have reported back to Mantra and then Mantra reported to us. And their follow-up scheduling rate is 90.9%. .9%. So students are really um, appreciating the um, Mantra Health services that's being offered to them. It's a wonderful resource. The next slide is comparison of number of counseling appointments by academic school for last academic year as reflected in blue and the current academic year in orange. And let me just uh, emphasize again, when you see the current academic year, that is up through mid-semester, October 19th, 2023. We've had a 22% increase in engineering students who uh, utilize the services of the Counseling Center. Um, other majors are Arts and Sciences, Education, Interdisciplinary Studies, and Fine Arts. Next slide is comparison of percent of unique students per total enrollment by academic school for fall 2022 versus fall 2023 orange. Again, that is mid-semester through October 19th. Um, as you can see, the largest percent comes from the uh, fine arts students. Uh, we, uh, we see this increase and we are actively working with the College of Fine Arts to put some extra programming in place to support those students. Uh, our assistant director of the Counseling Center and myself made a, a visit to the Craft Center recently and took materials and introduced ourselves and wanted to ensure that they knew they were supported as well. And we made them very well aware of the mantra health that they can access for counseling services as well. Will you help me understand why fine arts is so much higher than everybody else? It would seem to me a calculus course would give me a lot more trauma than making a pot out of clay. Is that an unfair statement that way? I don't, I don't get it. Well, um, I can speak to that on a personal level and I can speak to that on a professional level. Um, on a personal level, um, I have two students in college, one at this university and one at a different university, and they're both fine arts majors. So raising students that are fine arts majors lends me to um, trying to view them with self-imposed pressures um, to compete and do well and do well in their auditions and managing that stress. So on a personal level, I can say, yes, I've seen that. On a professional level, the rigor of the uh, fine arts department is extreme. It's extreme because there's a lot of academic pressure, a lot of performance pressure, and a lot of competition among the students. 
uh, that they, they impose on themselves. The professors don't impose that. And again, the self-imposed pressure they put on themselves lends itself to extreme amounts of stress. I can tell you, again, on a personal level, that my student uh, lives in the Brian Fine Arts Building. Um, that's, that's where he stays, and that's where he is quite often. Uh, many times, I'm having to encourage him to eat meals. Um, so it's it's a very competitive program, very self-imposed pressure, a lot of performances. So yes, we understand uh, the stress that comes with that. The next slide is number of unique clients by age for the last academic year and through mid-semester, October 19th, 2023. As you can see from this slide, as you would expect, the majority of our students are ages 18 to 24, but we do have non-traditional students as well. And we did, that's not reflected on this chart, we did have one 16-year-old student this year who was a transfer from a, a, a different university from a community college setting. So we were able to provide services for that student as well. The next slide is number of counseling appointments by academic level for the last academic year in blue and this academic year in orange, again, up through October 19th, 2023. Um, they all come. Um, but seniors seem every year to come the most. I think that lends itself to thinking about uh, career choices, career-related stress, financial stress, and just the transition from college to adult life. Um, I will explain to you there is a number on there that says unassigned. When I run the data, um, it by fault of the electronic medical records, it puts meetings in here. So if you don't fall into a classification, then you're unassigned. And I looked at each one of those, and those were some sort of counseling center related meeting. So those really don't count um, in the classification. But again, seniors come to the counseling center uh, followed by freshmen more often than any other student. The next slide is a grid that um, reflects the last five years of the student counselor ratio um, as outlined by what we currently have. And then on the last uh, column there is the recommendation by our credentialing body, which is the International Association of Counseling Services. They're the credentialing body for university uh, counseling centers. So in 2021 is when we had the turnover. We had three of our uh, counseling staff retire uh, coming out of COVID, and now we are back fully staffed. Now I said uh, on there that we have six licensed counselors. According to IACS, um, the any counseling center director does not count because the the main role is administrative, uh, I, although I do see clients and I do help with crisis walk-ins and programming all aspects of the counseling center. According to IACS, um, the co college counseling center directors don't count, so it's listed as five full-time counselors there. So our current ratio is one counselor per 2023 students, and the recommendation is 1.5, but actually it, it should be two counselors there to meet the standard from the credentialing body. Next slide is the top six reasons for visits uh, for the counseling center. Um, for 2022, 2023, and then this academic year up through 2019. So right in line with the national and state data, most students come to the counseling center for anxiety and depression. Um, what's unique about our counseling center is next is continuity of care. Continuity care is follow-up care after that initial appointment. So what that reflects is that students are coming back because they're getting good care. Students are coming back because they feel supportive and frankly we have a wonderful team of mental health counselors on this campus to help support our students and that's reflected there. Um, supportive coping life management is adjustment issues. So those 
seniors maybe want to be coming and talking about adjustment post-college or hey, do I go to grad school and what does that look like? Or they may be incoming freshmen dealing with the loneliness and social anxiety, adjustment to that. Um, so those are the top three reasons. Um, next is the rapid access. That on-demand service has really taken off since we started that and we plan to keep that. Um, other unassigned, when students come in, they can put what reason or they can opt to not put what reason they came. Um, relationships, issues, and trauma are listed next. But as I mentioned earlier, on a national level, according to the Healthy Mind Study, um, the top three national reasons students are coming to college counseling centers are anxiety, depression, isolation, slash loneliness. At the state level, it's depression, anxiety, and loneliness. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the American College Counseling Association said number three is social anxiety. Um, it was 61% in Tennessee that had uh, issues with alcohol and 51% nationwide. So again, we're doing a really good job with prevention on this campus. Um, and uh, we're trying really hard to support our students at this university in terms of mental health support. Is this information the parents ask about or students ask about when they're recruited to come to Tech or they don't think about it until they get here? Um, actually, this is something that students want to know about before they come to Tennessee Tech. Um, that is why we implemented the open houses for every single SOAR session. So we open up, um, when you come to the Counseling Center, we have the main center. Um, and, and then we have a kind of a group counseling room, meeting room off from it. So we open that up uh, and put out resources and information and we rotate counselors out for them to meet um, and ask questions. And the first year we started this, we had maybe nine people come up. And this was before COVID when we started doing this. And now we have anywhere from 20 to 30 families coming to our open houses at every session wanting to know what kind of mental health support and what kind of mental health resources and how can we help with mental health medication on this campus. So I'm really proud that we do those open houses that we're able to uh, talk to incoming freshmen, freshmen and potential students about what we do have to offer. So, but it might be four weeks. If I needed to come, I'd have to schedule four weeks out if you needed to come, you could come right now. We have a counselor on hand. Again, you don't have to have an appointment to come to the Counseling Center. Um, but the students, if you'll look at the continuity of care, they want those appointments. Um, they, are, they feel they're getting the support they need, so they're continuing to schedule with our counselors. And they are booking those appointments to ensure that those appointments are in place. Um, but you do not need an appointment um, to come to the Counseling Center. So if we didn't have the counseling center, a lot of students would just drop out. I didn't hear the first part of your question. I apologize. So if we didn't have the counseling center, then you, then you would suspect that a lot of students would just give up and, and drop out or turn to measures that are make things worse. Um, I, well, I would say that if you go back to the first slide, that we had 1,043 uh, 1, students come to the Counseling Center, I would say that's 1,043 students we retained, and that's 1,043 students that we're going to see uh, hopefully graduate successfully and know what wellness looks like when they graduate, that it's okay to come see a counselor uh, as they go on into graduate school or their career. So I think it's definitely beneficial to the university to have mental health support and care navigation on campus. And I, I'll just follow up with that, that, you know, I'm, I'm on a personal level and a professional level, I've been in the, in the mental health field for 29 years. And I celebrated that this year. And when I say celebrate, I think, oh my goodness, I get the opportunity to talk about mental health to a university board of trustees. That didn't happen 10 years ago. That didn't happen five years ago. That didn't happen 29 years ago. You didn't talk about mental health 29 years ago. And here I am with this wonderful opportunity to update you on the wonderful things that are happening on this campus in terms of mental health. That tells me that, that we're helping stigma go away and that we're role modeling for our students that it's okay 
to seek help. It's okay to ask for help because here I am talking to you about it and you're receiving the information in a positive light. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be open to, to questions. Just one comment. I really appreciated what you just said a few moments ago. And you know, the first two slides that you showed, you show basically a, an increase in number of students, an increase in a number of visits. And I always fear that people can look at that data and say, you know, oh, there is an increase in uh, mental health problems. I don't, I don't believe you interpret, should interpret it that way. I think that there is a decrease in the social stigma of seeking counseling. And I think that the university is doing a much, much better job, I think, of addressing that in society. And I think all the things that you're doing are contributing to, contributing to not just, uh, you know, the mental health of the students, which I think is critical, but the mental health of society, which I think has been a serious problem for a long, long time. So thank you very much. And I hope that uh, the university will continue to support the Counseling Center, and and I, I would say do what needs to be done to provide you with the needed capacity to address the students. And one comment too, I think several times you mentioned the percentage of people that seek counseling, and you have 1,043 on that one slide. We have about 10,000 students. Are we not at 10% roughly? I ran some numbers a couple weeks ago and I came up to 3.5% but that was based on this academic year. So we're, we're going to get close to some higher numbers, but that was me sketching numbers out, thinking to myself, we're really having a significant group of university students that utilize the counseling center. And um, I'm going with 10%. I'll agree with you. <laughs> and I will say, um, yes, we had the pandemic uh, really impact these students on a connection, social anxiety level, mental health level. But also, I want to brag on the Counseling Center team for doing such great outreach and programming and making students aware of what we have to offer, because uh, we really want to support our students and help them feel successful. I'll echo that too. The Counseling Center, as a student on campus, you see the Counseling Center everywhere. You know that resources are available. There's literature available, um, as well as in-person programming, presentations, events, and things like that. So thank you, Dr. Mick, and your team. I visited the Counseling Center. A lot of students have visited, whether it be their freshman year, sophomore year, at least once at some point, um, because it, that social stigma is starting to decrease in things, like Trustee Jones said. So thank you so much, and thank your team so much. But also, um, I wanted to brag on them as well, because I definitely appreciate it. Thank you for that comment. Thank you, Dr. Mick. A great presentation and good questions and good comments. And Dr. Pope Johnson, I apologize to you that I did not call on you to make the introduction at the beginning. But thank you very much for standing up and, and doing so. So great presentation. And with that, there's no action required on your report. So we appreciate that. And I will, uh, I guess, uh, Chairman Harper, we have completed our business. We're not very punctual today, but we did a good job with what we did. You certainly did. And the president needs to make one quick announcement before we break, before we take a break. And I would like to make a comment about the break after he does that. So. Yeah, I just want to take this opportunity to let everybody know it's sort of a sad uh, piece of news we've received this morning, but uh, Ms. J.J. Oakley, uh, the wife of Millard Oakley, who passed uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, J.J. passed away, uh, I think this morning or last night, one or the other, and just wanted to make everybody aware of that, particularly those on the board that uh, know the Oakley family, and uh, please uh, keep them in your thoughts and prayers, but... Uh, uh, sad news about Ms. J.J. Thank you. Yes, and I'm sorry to have to follow that bad news with more bad news, but that is our break is going to have to be very, very short. So um, it is now 1025. If you can be back here by 1030, that would be great. Uh, really try to get back in your seats, particularly the trustees, as quickly as you can because we are going to start as soon as everybody's in their seats. So uh, sorry, but we are running behind and we've got a lot of more business. Thank you.
you, Mr. Stites. Even though uh, Chairman Rose has caused me to be 30 minutes behind. She's gonna... not the only one, I'll point out. <laughs> we're going to do a miracle here and work this thing out. All right. I'd like to call the roll for the Audit and Business Committee meeting. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Jones. Here. Trustee Lynn. Here. Trustee Stites. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, sir. The minutes have been placed in diligent for your review. If there's no discussion, can I get a motion to approve the minutes for the September 28, 2023 meeting? So, so moved. moved. Thank you. And is there a second? Second. Thank you, Tom. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Jones. Here. Yes. Trustee Lynn. Ah. Uh, Trustee Stites. Ah. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. Financial update and composite, composite financial index. Dr. Sensel will give us an update on the financial outcome for 2022 and 2023. Dr. Stenson. Thank you. And <clears throat> I have promised that I can get through this information in half the time that I had planned. And so that's what we're going to do. Uh, so the uh, first part of the financial update, I have uh, Paul selected uh, sections of our financial statement that uh, will give you some sense of how we ended our fiscal year. So this is our statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in net assets. I just want to say that this is a reflection of the entire uh, financial operations of the university. It includes, in addition to the ENG uh, budget numbers that you usually approve in uh, auxiliary enterprise that's included in that budget. It does include our uh, research dollars. It does include uh, federal financial aid and state financial aid that comes in for our students. It does include capital appropriations. So it is the full picture, financial picture of what's happening at the university. These numbers are uh, prepared in accordance with our generally accepted accounting standards. And so some of the numbers you're going to see are different because there are rules in accounting that are different from, from our budgeting process. The one number I want to point out on this particular slide is the income loss before other revenues, expenses, gains, and losses. And that number is actually the most important because that is what we're doing from an operations standpoint. And I'll go through uh, those numbers on other slides. But that is the, the really important uh, number. Uh, there we have some major, as I'll talk about later, some major revenue sources for operations that uh, get recorded as not operating income. So. So looking at our operating revenues by source, uh, we did have, I'll point out uh, on this particular slide, we did have a reduction in tuition and fee revenues. That was not a reduction in our gross tuition and fee revenues. That was a reduction after tuition and fees have been uh, scholarships. Uh, allocations have been netted against those. And from a scholarship standpoint, on this particular uh, item on our financial statements, this is only the scholarships that students actually use to pay university charges. We do have uh, scholarship expense for dollars that students receive. And a prime example is a student who is living off campus. That's still a part of their overall cost of attendance budget, but they would be paying that uh, rental income to an off-campus uh, organization, and so that would show up under scholarship expense. But if they use it to pay tuition and fees on campus, it is netted against our tuition and fee number. The grants and contracts are the uh, resources that flow in to the university. <laughs> for uh, primarily for research and public service contracts. Uh, 
and those are only shown to the extent that we have expended those uh, because there are they are restricted uh, they do have a specific purpose and so we don't recognize those awards totally as revenue until we have actually earned them but as you can see we did have an increase in that particular category for fiscal year 23 compared to fiscal year 22. So looking at our operating expenses, we did have an increase in our fringe benefits, and it was primarily uh, the result of the cost for uh, pensions and uh, OPEB, of the other post-employment benefits that the state flows through to us at the end of each fiscal year based on you know, the, the cost that has been calculated for Tennessee Tech retirees. Uh, the other one I wanted to point out is the scholarships, and it was a pretty significant drop. That is because in fiscal year 22, our students did receive scholarship funds from uh, the HERF, from the Higher Education Emergency Relief Fund, and they, we did write those checks directly to the students. We did not uh, put those in, uh, I guess, their tuition and other charges, and so that, that did uh, create a difference in our scholarship expenses. Now, looking at our non-operating uh, revenue, and that was what I was uh, alluding to a few minutes ago, our state appropriations, which is a huge piece of our operating budget, is considered to be non-operating revenues from the standpoint of uh, accounting standards. And, and so it does show there, that's why I pointed out the number that was more important than our operating loss, which is just typical for a public university. The grants and contracts that are showing as non-operating revenues, those are actually uh, primarily made up of uh, PAL, SEOG, HOPE scholarships, those types of things that flow in and uh, and we use those, the students either use them to pay their uh, uh, university cost or it's a part of their uh, cost of attendance budget. So that, that is the financial aid. Um, the other one I wanted to point out, investment income, there is quite a significant increase in that. We do invest any resources, reserves that the university is holding in the local government investment pool. And this fiscal year 23, those investments did pretty good because they're, they're a pretty, uh, uh, they are not risky. They are, are pretty non-risky through the lo uh, local government investment pool. And also, uh, we are, uh, as we hold reserves for capital projects, we do invest those in an LGIP account so that we get a return on them while we're holding them. And then looking at other revenues, uh, we do have uh, capital appropriations. Here again, what we show on our financial statements for capital appropriations will not agree with what shows up in uh, the state's budget because we recognize state uh, capital appropriations to the extent that we have spent those monies. And, and so, uh, so that is just gonna be the dollars that have actually been spent. You can see we had in fiscal year 23, over $30 million, uh, and it's primarily related to the uh, construction of the engineering building, but also some other capital maintenance projects that we had going on on campus. I will say that this addition to endowment is for the university only. It is not for the foundation. And none of these numbers I'm showing you today include the finances for the foundation. It is just the finances for the university itself. So I pulled out a couple of other items off of our uh, financial statements that I thought uh, this committee would find uh, uh, useful uh, in your evaluation. And so I looked at our capital assets. Uh, just a reminder, we do record our capital assets at, at their cost when we uh, construct or purchase those capital assets. And that is that historical cost never gets adjusted. In, in our buildings, a lot of our buildings are fully depreciated. And, and so they have a zero uh, value on this the particular schedule. 
uh, we would, if we have a major renovation like the one we have, uh, are currently working on with Johnson Hall, uh, we would then go back and add that because it has extended the life of that building and added to its value and then depreciate that. Uh, the only other thing uh, that's kind of different is uh, what we refer to as Sabitas. Those are subscription-based information technology arrangements. And as the uh, technology world has changed and we're now doing uh, sub uh, service uh, software as a service, those types of things. We're doing much more instead of purchasing library resources that we put on the shelf, we purchase subscriptions that gives our students and, and our uh, faculty and staff access to online resources. Now we have to capitalize those. This is a new accounting standard for this particular year is effective with fiscal year 23. That's why you're not seeing anything in 22. Uh, we do have some software which is uh, showing under intangible assets that we actually own. For instance, our uh, current ERP system, the banner system, is, uh, is an intangible asset. Uh, one other thing I'll point out to you is we do have a note in our financial statements that, uh, showing that we have outstanding commitments under construction contracts of $187.5 million, of which $117.8 million will be covered through future state uh, capital appropriations. It's already been put into the state's budget, but as I said, we only get only recognize those as we spend them. The balance of that is projects, uh, for instance, our parking and transportation project that we're working on, the Peachtree project. Those are bond funded uh, projects and so, so they're not covered by state appropriations. So that is primarily the difference. Although we do have uh, the matching requirements for our uh, uh, buildings and also that major renovation in Johnson Hall. And, and so those numbers would not be included in that 117 million. And the next item is uh, where is the university standard from a debt standpoint? Uh, we do have uh, bonds payable, outstanding $75 million in fiscal year 23. We do have, uh, our bonds have uh, sold at a premium and so we do have some amortized bond premiums that we will amortize over the life of those bonds. Uh, so between the two of those, our out, total outstanding debt uh, was less in 23 than it was in 22. Of course, we'd made payments on our, uh, our annual debt service payments and that type of thing. Uh, we do have uh, about $5 million that has already been bonded on our uh, transportation project. And uh, so that also reduced their uh, outstanding bonds because they have, that money hasn't been spent yet. Uh, so if you have no, have no questions on the financial statements, uh, I'm gonna move on to the matrix or I'll take questions. Anyone have any questions? So what, what would be the interest rate if you had to borrow money today? It's somewhere around 5% right now. And it also depends, and I didn't talk about that, but uh, depends on the use of the building. So some of our bond issues are tax exempt and some of them, you know, uh, for instance, uh, when we bond the, the West uh, Stadium, uh, that's going to be a taxable bond issue because we do intend to make that facility when it's not being used for athletics, we'll make that facility available for rental and that defines our bonds then as taxable. Any other questions? If not, there's no uh, action required on this. Move on to the next item, please. So
So this is information that I've shared with you all uh, most uh, years in, in December. We're looking at our consolidated financial index, and of course that's the overall measure of the financial health of the university. But that uh, index is made up of the other four ratios, and uh, then those ratios, uh, they specifically answer uh, well, they answer specific questions and, and are very important to, uh, to the health of the university and judging the health of the university. So uh, those four ratios are used, uh, they are uh, weighted and scored using a formula that is a national formula that's used by all public and private universities. And uh, that formula also has certain indicators of expected values at, on a national level. And then we have watch levels, uh, a level that uh, would indicate that maybe the university uh, needed to make some changes to its operations uh, in order to stay viable. Uh, it does, uh, most of the information I'm talking about today does exclude assets from the foundation, although I do have one slide that does include a CFI, including the foundation. So looking at our uh, CFI, as you can see, uh, the watch level is at three. Uh, we are uh, up at uh, 6.3 at the end of fiscal year 23. That is driven a whole lot by uh, the fact that our operating budget, when we ended the year, we had uh, about a 15% fund balance of unspent funds as compared to the normal 2 to 4% that we budget and also our reserves for capital projects. Uh, we have those dedicated to those projects, but the, uh, we typically provide those to the state toward the end of projects, not at the very beginning of the project. So looking at the uh, different components, the primary reserve component, as you can see, as I said a few minutes ago, those reserves were holding for capital projects and also uh, the uh, fund balance that we had at the end of fiscal year uh, 23 did uh, drive up our uh, uh, ratio, primary reserve ratio. Uh, the industry standard is that you would be holding uh, close to five months worth of expenses in your reserves. Uh, we are, uh, for us, looking at our budget, uh, it, that would be about $78,300,000. Uh, we have in our reserves $53.6 million that are not dedicated to capital projects. But we also had another uh, close to 30 million that was unspent at the end of the fiscal year. So we are well within that five months of, of expenses. Looking at our viability ratio, which is uh, the ratio that uh, indicates our capacity to repay debt. This is not as important a ratio for public uh, universities in Tennessee because we are required to uh, have a revenue source to support the door debt payments on our bonds. We do uh, the state issues revenue bonds for the universities. Uh, so we are uh, well above that 1.25 uh, at, at this point because uh, it is driven to a large extent by the amount of reserves that we're holding. And the next ratio is our return on net assets ratio. Uh, that uh, increases and decreases according to our watch level or uh, expected level. Uh, increases and decreases based on the CPI. Uh, this year, fiscal year 23, we did use a 3.1% CPI, and then when you add uh, the, th uh, the other 3% above, uh, looking at 6.1%, we were actually, for fiscal year 23, we're at 16.4%, so we were uh, in, in good shape for, for that. And this ratio is impacted by uh, Capitalization, capitalization of projects also. 
And then the last one of the ratios is our net operating revenues ratio. And, and that's looking at whether uh, the dollars that you're expending are actually uh, covered by your uh, revenues coming in. The industry standard, as I mentioned earlier, is that you have two to four percent of uh, unspent resources that you could address any uh, emergencies or any opportunities that, that you might have. You'd be able to invest in those. Uh, and so we've had uh, a couple of years that we have been below uh, the watch level, but uh, not below zero, fortunately. And as I said, this year we did end the year with uh, quite a bit more fund balance than we had expected. And, and so that did keep us, uh, our level pretty high. So this slide is looking at the CFI in comparison uh, to actually the average for the uh, for all the LGIs. As you can see, the trend line on this is uh, very similar. Uh, but I did look at this if TTU was not included in that average. Uh, the trend line would still be very similar, but we did have some institutions that were uh, uh, quite a bit less than uh, Tennessee Tech. Uh, I do know from uh, meetings that we've had on a state level with the CFOs of the universities that uh, those uh, universities expect to have a much better CFI uh, for fiscal year 23. They have been dealing with some budget issues and uh, made some decisions not to do as much as the 5% pay increase uh, for their universities. So. And then uh, they, they have the opportunity, they have the, the right to do that. I mean, not that I think that's the right thing to do, but they can do that. Yes, uh, the portion that is in, this, in the governor's budget, in the state budget, has to be spent for salary increases. But none of the universities were required to actually match that for the full 5%. And, and so we did have universities that made the decision that they were not going to do more than what was in the, in the state budget. Thank you for clarifying that. So, Claire Reed, it's good to be us. Thomas, I think so. <laughs> Between this and the and the um, THEC numbers that Dr. Bruce presented earlier, I think this should be a billboard somewhere, right? So this is the, the slide that actually does show uh, both the universities and their foundations. That's true for uh, Tennessee Tech and also the UT system and for the uh, LGIs. And, uh, as you can see, uh, Tennessee Tech is uh, uh, above the other two, uh, the UT system and also the LGIs. I know that uh, the University of uh, Tennessee at Knoxville has uh, very similar numbers to what Tennessee Tech has, and some of their numbers are actually better. But as a system, uh, theirs is a very, very similar trend, but, but lower than what we have as a university. So I'd be glad to answer any questions about the, those CFIs. If there are no questions, there's no action required here. Just for your information, the information was given to you. So uh, move on. Next item. All right, and, and this item will uh, require action on the, on the part of the uh, committee and then the board later this afternoon. So I'm um, uh, looking at our revised budget and uh, any changes to the organizational chart. We did not have uh, significant changes to our organizational chart that's been included in your materials. We had some renaming of centers. Uh, we had one uh, campus safety and emergency management unit added to planning and finance. Uh, we had uh, some uh, breaking apart of units 
and renaming of some units that had occurred in uh, uh, the student affairs area. But that was, that was the changes that we had in our org chart for this time. So with this particular uh, budget, uh, what, it, what we're providing as information to you is a comparison between the revised budget that we're asking you to approve today and the proposed budget, which is the budget that you approved in June that we started fiscal year with. And, and so we actually had of total revenues, we have had an increase between proposed uh, of $3.5 million. That primarily has been made up of an increase in our state appropriations. And uh, two of the items under state appropriations is very typical, where we will receive adjustments from the state for the OPIBs I talked about earlier, and, and our TCRS rate, uh, risk, risk management insurance, and our health insurance. So that uh, amounted to about a million dollars. And then the state does a, four, they have a 401k program, and they do offer a $100 per employee match for any employee that puts $100 of their own money in uh, to the 401k program. And, and so that is the funding that, that makes that match. And then the Crossful Wind Tunnel, it was approved as a part of the state's budget, but it was approved later than some of the other things that happened in the state budget. And, and so we did not have time to get it into the July budget, although it was available to us in July. So we've added it to the revised budget. And we had some bouncing around of tuition and fees, uh, ended up uh, pretty darn close when you consider the dollars that we're talking about, uh, a, a, a reduction of about 259000 We had uh, summer revenues were, were less than we had expected. Looking at our changes in expenses, we did the same thing here. We compared uh, the revised budget that we're asking you to approve to the proposed budget that we started the year. We did add uh, $28 million to the revised budget. So you might ask if we didn't have $28 million in revenues, how did we get there? And that is the carry forward. That is the main uh, change in that budget is the carry forward. And so this gives you uh, the details uh, if you uh, go through and add up all of those rebudgets of carry forwards, you're going to get to about $22 million. And then, of course, we have uh, the wind tunnel. We also did some funding on scholarships for. Uh, uh, athletics uh, for community college transfers and also a, a small adjustment to presidential scholarships. Dr. Stinson, I have a question on the carry forwards. It's Trustee Luna. Um, in looking at this list, two of them I would like uh, concern me, I guess I could say. You know, the technology access fee is a fee that we charge students to have access to technology. The online and alternate delivery fee is a fee that we charge students to uh, make sure that we're providing good virtual classes. And together, if you add those numbers, that's almost $6 million of money that was carried forward. I think sometimes there are questions about how, you know, which of those two funds should be used. So for example, you might have a computer lab where students go in because they're going to take their history class for the next hour before they go to their engineering class. It could be helpful for whoever needs to spend that money down to get those people all in one room and identify because this is the carry forward from last year, which means that there's also, for example, in that technology access fee, about another 2.5 coming this year. So the actual budget for the TAF this year is about $5 million. And I don't know off the top of my head, the OAF one, but all in all, that is a lot of money that our students are paying in fees. And when I look at that, I expect that when a student sits down at a computer at Tennessee Tech, it, it is a nice computer. It is the best of the best in the state, right, because they're paying into that. So any comments there? Uh, yes, uh, that's something. Those two items are on our radar uh, to start looking at. I know that the TAF committee, uh, based on what uh, Brian Seiler has been able to tell me, they were taking a look at those. Uh, they have, have typically had projects that carry forward, but uh, 
you know, at some point, the logic for me, that's my logic, is that, that sh those projects should be clearing out, and I'm not seeing that. So, yes, I have the same concerns that you do. Uh, and we'll take another look at the uh, online fee. I think there are probably some uh, uh, items that uh, the online fee was designed to address that uh, maybe it hasn't the way it's currently structured. And so uh, we may have to take another, well, we do have to take another look at that. So, yes. Dr. Stinson, just how did, I how do the mechanics work here? I mean, the carry forwards, in theory, will get spent this year. Is that going to create a problem next year when we don't have carry forwards? Or are there specific projects around the 15% increase versus the 187 or 28 million? Uh, so that's uh, something that we're uh, that we monitor, and uh, and, and so uh, this year's carry forward was uh, uh, pretty high, uh, but uh, that has been true uh, for the last few years that we've had carry forwards that that were rebudgeted in October, uh, and, and so a part of our always looking at this is. Uh, the question that uh, Trustee Luna asked a few minutes ago, you know, we look at these and say, you know, uh, what are we not doing that we should be doing with these funds that are, are available? But if you remember, uh, the online fee was an it's, it was a more recently approved fee. And, and so I know that the academic areas have some uh, plans for, for those dollars, but they are one-time expenditures. And we are very careful to make sure that they are not doing, uh, they are not, I'm a, let me back up, we are not doing anything that creates ongoing obligations to those one time. And, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, I know that for the, for instance, the engineering state appropriation carry forward, I know that engineering has plans for those dollars because they've got two new buildings. They got one that's gonna open pretty soon and they've got another one that's gonna start construction pretty soon and they will be using and those dollars to do things like buy equipment that they couldn't otherwise afford. And so I know that there has been some deliberate holdback on the on those uh, on those funds for for that kind of thing. Uh, I'm trying to see if there was any uh, the lab salary. Uh, that's another thing that uh, that we look at. Uh, it, uh, it, it's fairly typical, uh, but you know, they came up earlier today uh, about our turnover, you know, take a look at our turnover. And, and so, you know, lap salaries could go down or up, but there again, we do not spend those monies on creating obligations going forward. For the, for the online access fee, though, I mean, if we don't expect the, in the TAF, if we don't expect these funds to go away, or these fees, we're not, we're not voting as a board to remove these fees, then wouldn't some portion of that be recurring, right? So could go into recurring expenses, not only into one-time expenses? Only to the extent that, it, that you would look at that expense and say, okay, here's the resources that I have and I can fund a position for three years. And, and you would do a, a position that is not a permanent position, but more like a restricted position. So in that case, they could be, uh, and, and that's something I think that's going to happen as we move forward with our uh, research where we're uh, actually uh, creating research uh, positions that are more limited. Uh, All right, so the next item that I have is a just showing expenses from a different direction, and that is uh, uh, by natural classification. And uh, I think this fits right into to what uh, Trustee Luna was talking about. So if you look under salary and wages, we have $2.3 million of those carry forwards that have been transferred over to salaries and wages. But those are, uh, very temporary. 
They're not permanent positions. They are, the units are using them for adjuncts, they're using them for temporary employees, and they're using them for student workers. So that it's not a long-term contract that, that you have an obligation for. Uh, the only <clears throat> other thing uh, that I wanted to point out is uh, when we rebudget, carry forward, we do rebudget it as operating in utilities line item from a natural classification and then the units have the flexibility then to move those around. They may decide they want to use some uh, as you can see, there's been already been some uh, dollars transferred to travel, and it, it could be that you know they're going to use some of those funds for faculty professional development, staff professional development, uh, to help support uh, student travel, those types of things. So they do have the flexibility of moving those around. We just don't know where they're going to use them, and so we budget them at the university level and operating in utilities, and then they tell us how they want them moved. So that's all I have, unless there are other questions. Does anyone have any questions? If there's no questions, can I get a motion to send the 2023-2024 revised budget and organizational chart to the board for approval and to place it on the board's regular agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Secretary, please take the roll. Trustee Jones. Aye. Trustee Lynn. Aye. Trustee Stites. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. The next item is the Tuition Transparency Act. Dr. Stinson will present this information. So this was a very easy report for us to put together. It is required by the TCA. Uh, but we did not have a tuition increase for fall of 22 in academic year 22-23. Uh, and, and so we are submitting, uh, after you look at it and approve it, we are submitting a zero uh, tuition increase. This covers both tuition and mandatory fees. And uh, so we have prepared a zero report on that. It does require approval, though. That should be on a billboard somewhere too, shouldn't it? <laughs> okay, does anyone have any questions about the zero tuition increase? If not, is there a, uh, a motion to send the Tuition Transparency Act report of 2022-2023 to the board for approval and to place it on the board's regular agenda? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Secretary, please take the roll call. Trustee Jones. Aye. Trustee Lynn. Aye. Trustee Stites. Aye. Motion carries. Great. Item six, classification and composition, compensation study update. Uh, uh, is there anything else you got to do? Kevin Vetter is going to do that report. But before we do that, I want you all to notice that I am one minute over. <laughs> I wasn't going to point it out because I was going to wait till the end. I have a feeling we might eat some of it back up. But anyway, thank you for doing that. Uh, Trustee Stites, if I could, um, as Kevin's coming to the podium. Let me just set this up a little bit on the classification compensation study. Uh, the purpose here today is to update the board on the on the progress made to date on the study. It's not completed. Uh, we originally anticipated the possibility of it being done by now, uh, but it's taken a little bit longer. And Kevin can explain some of that if he chooses to. But uh, we would anticipate being able to come to the board in at the March meeting with a uh, with the study complete at that point in time, and uh, and then uh, hopefully being uh, able to uh, recommend something to the board for action based on those findings from the report. But uh, the study is is moving forward. It's making great progress, and uh, really appreciate the. Uh, the help from the Mercer group in doing this. This, this is, uh, they, they are providing a level of expertise that we do not have, and they give a national perspective on this that's very, very useful. So I, I just wanted the board to, to get a kind of a overview of where we are with it at this point in time, 
and uh, we're, we're going to make sure we get this thing right uh, to the fullest extent of our ability. So uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thank you, Dr. Oldham. Kevin Vetter, go. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Oldham, for that. Uh, this slide really just kind of uh, reflects what uh, Dr. Oldham was talking about as far as Mercer and uh, their uh, capabilities in the space of human resource consulting. And one of the reasons why uh, we selected Mercer for this engagement, primarily in the upper left quadrant of the total rewards area and the talent and performance management, they have a lot of expertise, especially uh, expertise in the higher education space to really help us get this right. So, uh, you know, we really uh, have found that they're being uh, helpful and beneficial in that engagement. Uh, using their you know vast resources capabilities and experience uh, to really look at the needs of the university both for today and position us for tomorrow as it relates to our compensation and classification program so uh, i thought it was important that we highlight that and uh, you know the, the reason for mercer and how they're helping us through this engagement uh, this next slide is really just uh, an overview of where we're at um, you know, Mercer is working currently on finalizing the job architecture and the position descriptions for non-faculty positions depicted in this blue block. And a little bit more to, to explain on that, that entails over 800 unique positions to evaluate and look at. And from that, uh, we're down to uh, about 300 unique jobs. So as we've gone through that, we found that there's some redundancies, duplications, uh, a lot of uh, positions that are similar. So we're being able to refine those position descriptions to get those down to a more manageable number. Um, also creating the job architecture based on job families and subfamilies and using uh, four distinct career streams to help us uh, you know, organize and classify the various staff positions that we have at the university, those being, you know, support, professional, managerial, and executive level positions, and we'll be able to use that going forward uh, to, to really manage the, the comp and class uh, uh, structure across the university. Uh, and then that will also help enable us when we get that architecture in place for Mercer then to go out and do market-based compensation benchmarks uh, so we can look at our staff positions in particular uh, to comparable positions out in industry. Uh, and likewise, they'll also be doing the same thing for our faculty. Uh, the faculty is a little bit more straightforward because you can compare apples to apples with faculty positions in, in the comparable markets that we're going to be looking at for those benchmarks. Uh, but we needed to have a job architecture alignment so we can make sure that as we're looking out across the broader market, that we're comparing like positions to be able to get a perspective for you know where our salaries are at relative to the market whether it be in the higher education market or the greater industry because a lot of our staff positions we're not only competing with obviously the higher education marketplace but the the greater broader private sector such as information technology positions uh, our uh, facilities area for skilled trades as an example, and those are just a few of the types of positions that really are more of a market-based uh, competition versus higher ed specific. So um, as we go through that, like I said, we're gonna initiate market-based salaries, and then from that we'll be able to implement, implement our compensation classification uh, plan, and then with that, you know, as far as what's our objectives and how we go about putting that plan into place, uh, starting, uh, you know, with the target of uh, March the 1st to come back and say, here's the plan and here's what we need to do to implement that. Um, subject to any questions, that's, that's my update at the present time. Any questions? Did you say already, do you have any idea when you may finish? I'm sorry, what was the question? When do you think you'll be finished with the study? Uh, we'll, we'll conclude the study uh, by the end of, um, you know, February and, and be ready to come back with the board with some actionable items in, in March. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Vetter. There's no action required on this, just information. So we're now at approval of the audit plan and that is done by Dina Metz who will present the audit plan for the calendar year 2024. Thank you. 
Um, on tab seven, uh, an audit plan for calendar year 2024 has been uploaded into diligent for the committee's review and approval. It lists each significant activity to be carried out by internal audit uh, in the upcoming year, and it gives the date that the last time that activity was performed, along with the primary functional area covered by the activity. Their order of presentation generally are required audits, audits already in progress, uh, the new audits that we've scheduled based on our risk analysis and management input, then required investigations, follow-ups, and reviews, and departmentally scheduled reviews. Do you have any questions about that? Okay, if there's no discussion, is there any discussion? If not, then can I get a motion to approve the 2024 audit plan as presented? And as required by the Tennessee Tech University Audit Committee Chart Audit Committee Charter, excuse me. So moved. Thank you, Thomas. Is there a second? Seconded. Thank you. Secretary, please call the roll. Trustee Jones. Aye. Trustee Lynn. Aye. Trustee Stites. Aye. Motion carries. Now this motion does not go to the board, so it just stays at the committee level. So uh at this point, we need to adjourn this session and go to the open session or closed session. How's Mr. Stites, you are 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Boom! After coming in 30 minutes behind schedule. So I want to give you a lot of credit, you and your committee. I'm very glad we had all the conversation we had this morning about everything, but you all made up some great ground this morning, and thank you for that. I would like to wait, make one comment. I'm finding out why nobody wants this position of chairman, because there's people that I don't know that come here from Nashville and other places who are very serious about what they're doing, and they got big piles of stacks of stuff, and they come in and they look straight at me and they say, are you aware of anything in this university that could cause increased risk to the university. <laughs> and I have, to, I have to say yes or no. And they write it down, whatever I say. And then they ask, well, if you're not aware of anything that increases the risk, are you aware of anything that might uh, cause uh, laws to be broken or that's illegal? And again, I have to answer, and then they write that down. And then they say, which is a little bit of concern to me, we will get back with you. Well, so. Mr. Stites, this is exactly why we pay you so much money. <laughs> so for anybody who doesn't know, we are not paid. We're all volunteers. And so anyway, that's, a, so, that's great. Uh, I just know that I know all of your names. I don't know where all of you live, but I can find out. You sure can. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. I appreciate it. I think we will adjourn this session, and uh, we will start our closed session. And I do thank everyone for their promptness in this uh, morning's meetings.